world gone insane. An upside down civilization cannot be real. A world of madness and terror. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Today's show is brought to you by Casper. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com forward slash Dana and using the promo code Dana. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And of course, by wonderful, I mean living in a state of total, unending, frantic chaos and constantly forgetting that you have to buy stamps and tape. But we have an amazing show providing two very interesting looks inside the beautiful business that we call show to wrap up the 2016 calendar year. Pete Aronson is here. Pete is the head of programming and development at the Independent Film Channel. Not only is uh, he the executive who shepherded my show, Stand Against Evil, through development and production, he is also an old friend of mine who I met first as a writer. And I thought as we wrap up the year, who better to give you an executive's perspective of the TV business, but in a way that regular people can understand and relate to. Pete is smart, he's funny, he is a profoundly decent human being, but he's managed to stay working in show business despite all that. Also, Cliff Nesteroff and Drew Friedman are here. Cliff wrote one of my favorite books of 2016, The Comedians, a history of stand-up comedy in America, now in paperback, and Drew Friedman. Drew is something of a legend. He is a cartoonist and a caricature artist. You've seen his work on the cover of The New Yorker, The New York Observer, the late great Spy Magazine. But his notoriety goes all the way back to the underground comics of the early 1980s, like Weirdo and Screw. His book, Any Resemblance to Persons Living or Dead, is purely coincidental, is one of the single funniest things I have ever read. And his new book, More Heroes of the Comics, is out right now. Me? Oh, I'm around. On New Year's Eve, I will be at the Neil Blaisdell Concert Hall in Honolulu with Bill Maher and Margaret Cho. And on January 1st, We'll all be at the Maui Arts and Cultural Center on Kahului. On January 11th, I will be at the Dairy Arts Center in Boulder, Colorado. And from January 12th through the 14th, I will be in Denver at the Good Old Comedy Works. Finally, on January 27th and 28th, I will be in San Francisco at Sketchfest with a very special show on January 27th where Stand Against Evil's Janet Varney and I are leading an all-star cast in a live staged reading of Plan 9 from Outer Space. It is the definition of a labor of love. For details on all of these and other happenings, please go to the Performing Live page at danagould.com for links, info, etc. And now, my God, while there's still time, Now, those of you who listen to this podcast may have heard that I have a little show on television uh, on IFC, and the story of how that uh, show came about is quite simple. I never set out to make a television show. I was just looking for a little genre horror movie thing to do, sort of for fun, and I thought I'd do this little digital five-minute short, maybe, based on the premise of what if my dad fought monsters because it was sort of a running joke amongst my brothers and I that if my, you know, whatever the situation would be, uh, if my dad was in the biplane shooting at King Kong, if the all-star game was on, he would have veered away and gone on to watch the game. 
Uh, and I just thought that was a, a funny kind of character and there'd be a funny joke in it. Then I happened to have uh, lunch with uh, my friend Pete Aronson, who works at IFC. And Pete said to me uh, quite offhandedly, uh, you should write a funny X-Files. And I said, I kind of just did. And uh, and I pitched it to him and, uh, you know, I had to change some things because uh, I was pitching a five minute short and he was thinking about television shows. But uh, I ended up uh, working with him and we uh, created the show. And what's, Pete's been a friend of mine for a long, long time. And he's a television executive uh, who uh, has also been a writer and is also probably most interesting, a race car driver. So I thought, why not trick him into coming on the show? So under the auspices of going to dinner, and then, oh, now that you're here, do you have an hour? Please welcome Pete Aronson. <laughs> this is the sound of my voice. Now, Pete, you are, by all intents and purposes, what we in the creative community would call a suit. Yes, despite the fact that I won't wear them anymore. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you don't have to wear suits anymore. No, I used to, but I don't have to wear them anymore. Suits, suits. Uh, my favorite suits that people would wear were in all the in the science fiction movies in the late seventy, in the early seventies. All the suits in the future were just suits from the early seventies. So, according to the early seventies, in the future, we're all wearing turtlenecks, and we have big, big sideburns. Yes, and apparently Nehru was far more influential than we thought, <laughs> yeah, yeah. because almost every costume design begins and ends with that jacket. You see those early Johnny Carsons from before they moved to Burbank, when yes. the show was still in New York? Yes. He was big in like the Nehru jacket, the With a medallion. Neck, with a medallion or a scarf. Mm -hmm. Like the late 60s. Mm -hmm. A Paul Lind kerchief, yeah. if you will. Well, when you were a kid... And this doesn't apply to Johnny Carson, but when you were a kid, you didn't know there was such a thing as gay people. You just knew no. that there were guys that were ascots on the Hollywood squares. Yeah, or just, you know, Freddie Mercury was super energetic. Very energetic. Committed bachelor. Com uh, yes. <laughs> Confirmed bachelor was the name of it. And what a voice. What a voice. But Paul Lynn, Charles Nelson Riley. Sure, oh, all straight. Confirmed. <laughs> big ladies, man. <laughs> yep. Charles Paul Lynn, big ladies, man. Mm -hmm. um, but now how long uh, you started off... What was your first job in show business? I was uh, my junior year of college. That summer, I was Don Imus's intern at 66 WNBC in New York. Wow. So you go all the way back to, you start with They called Imus. it radio back then. They called it radio. Yep. Don Imus, for those of you who don't know, sort of the political version of the Grease Man. Yes, or uh, the, you know, the precursor to Howard Stern. In fact, they right. were both on NBC at that time. Right. And Howard Stern was not Howard Stern yet. No, he was the afternoon guy. Yeah. He was not Howard Stern yet. The morning guy was Don Imus. What I find interesting is also like Howard Stern to, to go back and hear the thing. And, and Rush Limbaugh was, I think, John Stone? He yes, was like, that's correct. Yeah, and he was just a rock DJ in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he just latched onto this. Radio is as horrible, horrible as Howard Stern says it is, and then some. Yeah. Is and what it's I would the, say. And it's the carnival. You know, it, yes. I, you know, I was talking to. You mean the broken down jalopy of show business that comes into town, sets up shop. And yeah, then yeah, yeah, sure. Then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and tells you, you know, tells you where to bury all your money so that in two days it'll double in size. And then when you go back to get it, there's a hole where your money was. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah. And all these guys, they just, I was talking to one of the, one of the anchors of one of the three major cable news shows. And he was telling me, or she, uh, good cover. Yeah. And by that one, it can only be one of them now. It was Rachel Maddow or Chris Hayes. And I say that because I'm not sure which one is the other. Uh, same glasses. On a good night, I believe 60% of what I say. On a good night, you know, and mm -hmm. Rush Limbaugh believes eh, 10%, 20%. He is a committed right wing ding dong. Yes. But he knows it's all bullshit. Yeah, much like Dr. Phil, it's a facade. Yes. Yeah. And and Dr. Phil and also Dr. Oz. You know, it's amazing how quickly these guys become diet gurus. Like they launch into that housewife market. They see where that bread is buttered so fucking quick. That's who's home all day. Somebody told me a super cool story. Barbara Walters was in the hospital in New York. This is like two years ago. Dr. Oz comes in, in scrubs, 
and says, hi, Barbara. I'm just, I, I'm attached to this hospital. I was doing my rounds. How are you? Good. And he looks at her chart and then starts talking to her and starts asking her questions about syndication, you know, television <laughs> syndication. And then he thanks her. She says, doing well. Looks at her chart, hangs up her chart, leaves. Then about an hour later, her doctor comes by and Barbara goes, oh, Dr. Oz came in here. He already did my chart. And I went, what? He doesn't work here. That's fantastic. That has to be true. It's got to be. Yeah. Got to be. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. Well, that's the thing that you quickly realize. After the Trump shit, I totally believe yeah. that. Yeah. Well, that's, okay. and that's the thing you realize. The that, guy's a complete fraud. Yeah, total. I mean, it's just, but there's a level of bracing shamelessness to it. <laughs> yes. It's just but it, so shameless. I will say it shows his complete conversion to the faith of show business. Yes. Absolutely. That he came in and said, which station group? Yeah, that's when, what you're, just, when you're syndicating the show, there's the Fox station group. Yeah. And I know that. And and what other station group bids? Tribune? Yeah. And, Time, and Warner what Brothers? Would happen if she's flatlining. One moment. One <laughs> moment just please. one sec. Hypothetically, <laughs> the license fee that you're paying, Barbara. <laughs> but you're in, a real, you're in a weird situation because you, what is your official title? Executive Vice President of Programming and Production. Oh, you're, if you're not getting laid off that title, I can't help you. Well, I'm married, so yeah. no. So I know you're not laying. <laughs> exactly. Well, that was the old joke that I finally – that was an old joke of mine, by the way, that it was nice to see finally get into the mainstream. That that was – that was – by which I meant that the, the people finally started stealing it. Christian conservatives are opposed to gay marriage, but they believe that gay sex is an abomination. What will stamp out gay sex faster <laughs> – <laughs> than gay marriage. <laughs> you think you would be running with this thing. As someone who's been married three times, my position on that is fairly simple, which is I believe all gay people have the right to give away all their money <laughs> to divorce attorneys and or their exes uh, at the time of their choosing. I think it was John. I Well, my friend Matt Weinhold, who's been on I know the Matt. show, who you know very well, um, he does a show with John Waters for the Playboy channel. And it's a really brilliant show. I got to get the name of it. Um, Matt is one of these great guys, a really funny comedian and a really funny Very writer. Funny, and he literally just found this niche with the Playboy channel. And he just started creating these shows with the Playboy channel. And it, 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 he fell into it and he literally fell into it. And the way one would fall into the grotto and find themselves. <laughs> Covered in Lee Marvin spunk. Um, I usually say Jim Brown. Yeah, but Jim, sure. yeah Jim, Jim Coburn. A lot of James Coburn. A lot of James Coburn in that grotto. I've been in the grotto, by the way. I'm sure you've been in the grotto. I, I shot there. I shot an episode of Bernie Mac at the Playboy. Oh, Mansion. okay. Um, but uh, he was saying that John Watt. I, it might have been John Waters. It might be somebody else. But he was like. What the fuck? I don't want to get married. I don't want to. He loved being, and I, I might be attributing this to the wrong person, but I think it was John Waters. Like, he liked being an outlaw, thought marriage was ridiculous. Like, no, I, I don't want any of that baloney. I have a friend who said they always thought one of the benefits of being gay was not having to do that. I do know that RuPaul like, insists on calling herself a tranny. He was like, honey, I'm a tranny. Right. <laughs> like, With I, no regard for how yeah, outre yeah, that word yeah, has like, become. Yeah, I heard it. Like, <laughs> you know, there was a time when you couldn't say it, and now you can say it. I'm joined today by two authors. I feel like Carson in the late 70s. They, yeah. they used to have authors on them. Yeah. Can I be Gore Vidal rather, <laughs> rather than Norman I want to be like Calvin Trillin. Exactly. Uh, Calvin Trillin. And who was the, uh, who was the, the, uh, woman author that was always on? Oh, Joy, uh, well, not Joyce Carol Oates. Um, uh, no, she, but she was in Playboy every, Joyce Carol Oates was yeah. in every I issue of she Playboy. She was a hottie. What about yeah. Irma Bombeck? Irma Bombeck. Irma right. Bombeck. Yeah, yeah, Irma yeah. Bombeck. I was waiting for her to be funny. I, oh, she was one of those <laughs> first to be funnier. <laughs> well, you know, Ir Irma Bombeck, uh, collaborated with Bill Keen of the family circus. <laughs> of course. Yes. They put out books together wow i have the complete set <laughs> <laughs> and of course bill also made his wife do all those paintings and took credit for them no oh, that's, a, that's different a different keen yeah um anyway let me introduce you uh as we get talking uh uh the author of the excellent book the comedians which is now out in paperback a uh a history of basically stand-up comedy yes sir. in its in its various forms 
uh, in the United States starting at the turn of the century? Yes, more or less, yes. Yeah, the turn of the other century, not not starting in 2000. No. Starting in 1900. Cliff Nesteroff is here. Hello, everybody. Hi, Dana. <laughs> Hi, Cliff. <laughs> Good to have you back in the house. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a couple of days. Uh, and uh, the uh, one of my uh, one of my uh, a, a huge influence on my comedy uh, years ago was a book called "Any Resemblance to Persons Living or Dead Is Purely Coincidental," which was written by uh, created by Drew Friedman and his brother Josh, and it was a compilation of your cartoons. From heavy metal, mostly, or from heavy metal, from Raw magazine, from Weirdo magazine, Robert Crumb's magazine, right, and from National Lampoon, early stuff that we did, the more subversive comics we did originally, yeah. and that stipple style I used to draw, right, that used to drive my wife crazy. It is the laugh out loud funniest, like just book in terms of just the, the uh, when I when I first got it, I got it in in the mid eighties, and my friends and I we would just carry it around with us. Like, I couldn't believe there was a cartoon about William Frawley, <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause I, I'm a little bit younger than you. So I wasn't in on those magazines at the time. I grew up in the middle of Massachusetts yeah. where uh, we didn't have any cool stuff. Well, I was doing comics about Tor Johnson. Yeah, I know. I, was- I got a letter from somebody saying, I didn't know anybody else ever heard of Tor Johnson. Yeah. It's like, I thought I was alone. Well, that it, it is how I felt when I was reading the book. It was like, I'm reading a comic strip about Tor Johnson, and it's awesome. It's the same feeling I had when I saw Ed Wood. It was like I'm I'm in a theater watching a major movie studios movie about Ed Wood, and it's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what, anyway. Um, Drew Friedman is here. Uh, say hello, Drew. Hi, Dana. Hi, Cliff. Uh, Drew has a new book entitled "More Heroes of the Comics," which is uh, the second edition. Uh, and it's basically well. Why don't you uh, put it best? Well, this, the first edition was called "Heroes of the Comics." This is the sequel. Um, this is a, a tribute uh, to early comic book creators, guys who started in that business in the early '30s to the mid '50s uh, before. Um, EC Comics went out of business and comics were sort of sanitized at that point. So these are the early guys who started, who launched the business. Right. And they're all, and there's a, there's a, there's a big similarity, uh, in the comedians of that era and the golden age of comics of that, like the, the golden age of comics and the, and sort of the birth of sick humor, although the sick humor came along a yes. little bit later. Yeah, the they 50s. sort of go hand. They're all Eastern immigrant, the Eastern European immigrants mm-hmm. from New York. <laughs> all, yeah, absolutely. They all served in World War II. Say they all, G- Jews. Jews. They all have uh, gentrified names. It's, 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 yeah. And in the forties, they were both, uh, uh, both in stand up and in comics kind of dealing in the squeaky clean and the all American ideal where right. behind the scenes, these creators were anything, but they were kind of depraved fellows often, you know, with shattered lives, yeah, or yeah. drinking problems and whatnot. And then in the fifties, the whole style of humor in America kind of changed with Jules Pfeiffer. Jules Pfeiffer takes credit for the phrase sick comedy, which is uh-huh. what people like Lenny Bruce and Mort Saul and Nichols and May were kind of, uh, um, tagged with by people who did not like them, like yeah. Joey Bishop and stuff like that. And then of course, Mad Mag, Magazine belongs to that whole right. uh, tradition and, that changed in the 50s. And the story of Mad Magazine actually, uh, it, it comes out of the comics code, if I'm not mistaken. Well, becoming a magazine, it started as a comic book. Right. Har- Harvey Kurtzman created it. And when EC Comics went under, all those horror comics went under, Bill Gaines had one publication left, Mad. And he turned that into a magazine so to avoid the comics code so they could do whatever they wanted. And Harvey Kurtzman stayed with it until he had a falling out with Bill Gaines and moved on. Right. But, well, but let's, Jules, let's back up to the origin of that because I want because Jules Pfeiffer is in the book. Jules Pfeiffer, actually, his first comic for the Village Voice was called 666. So right. that's why he takes credit for that word. Uh, it's became, not his original name. His, the, the, the title became Pfeiffer for that comic. Right. Story, but Jules is in the book because I, I actually knew him when I was a kid. He was da- friends with my dad. And uh, so I, I felt he should be included for, for a few reasons. Right. Now, people should know your dad. Your dad is the author. Yeah, his name is Bruce J. Friedman, sure. and he's still around. And you'd know <laughs> his work. You'd know his work mainly from probably Steam Bath. And uh-huh. to this day, like guys who were teenagers back then, still thank me. They say thank your dad for introducing nudity onto primetime TV because Valerie Perrine was naked, you know, right. in that show. <laughs> but you should, so you should that's, his, that's his legacy. But your basically. father belongs to this genre of literature that was concurrent with that genre of stand-up in the fifties. So you have Lenny Bruce, Mort Saul, Nichols and May in the fifties. Then in literature in the early sixties, you have people like your father, Bruce J. Friedman, Joseph Heller, Terry, Philip Roth, right. all Terry kind Southern. of Terry Southern. Terry Southern. They were all his, my dad's friends. World's worst. 
first house guest, Terry Southern. Did you have Terry at the house? No, but I read a book about him. <laughs> okay. There's a movie being made about him by his son, Niall. Uh, oh, yeah. It's in the works. Supposedly, he was the famous, like, the, it would, it's like having Keith Moon say at your house. It right. It's like, uh, right. what happened to the TV? I sold it. What? 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 I used um, to stay at my dad's apartment a lot, and it was interesting, you know, uh, back in the day. That's true. But really I knew him when I was a little kid, and he was a sweet guy, you know, and, uh, you know. Yeah. But a good dad, too. I remember that. That was Jules Pfeiffer. Who is this? Is, uh, it's it's an example of like what we have today, Saturday Night Live, and the, and the current state of stand up, and, and the way the way that American comedy addresses social issues. Uh, the modern version of that, he was one of the pillars of that, uh, especially in, in in political cartooning. Um, uh, how, tell us a little bit about Jules Pfeiffer, because if you if you buy Heroes of the Comic Books, you get a portrait of Jules. I'm trying to describe the book. You get a portrait of him that you painted. I'm, I'll explain why he's in the book because yeah. he's not. He did never actually worked for a comic book, and these are people who actually worked in that business of comic books. But he's in for two reasons. He worked as an assistant to Will Eisner, who was a cartooning legend. He did the Spirit, yeah, the sp- starting in the, the 40s, and and Jules became his assistant when he was a teenager. And Will Eisner was more than happy to hire him because Jules Pfeiffer required hardly any money and will eisner love that and then the second reason is he, jules is in is because he wrote a book called the great comic book heroes in the early 60s which became you know it was a history of the early comic books and the creators and showed the first adventures of all of wonder woman and superman and, right. and batman and so he wrote that book and that like you know i absorbed that book and that was like going back to the beginning the origins so my book is sort of an extension of that you know showing the actual people that people you know the uh, people you don't need you don't even know what they look like for the most part and it's amazing that you d- and you don't know what they did i mean the, the, we, we covered this the, the the first time you were on the story of the origin of superman uh is well to this day it's like how did that happen where these two young jewish guys from cleveland teenagers came up with that character and, Ju- uh, and their names are jerry siegel joe schuster, Joel schuster and they're on the jerry cover siegel, they're right. on the cover of the new book right. they were in the first book but as older men here they right. are in 1939 um creating the character like at the dawn of superman 1939 in cleveland and and then um they sold that character for 130 dollars to national dc comics to harry donenfeld uh, who was the publisher of national and his assistant his former accountant his partner then um jack Leibowitz, and they're on the right. back cover of the book right now let's let's just make that point again. They created Superman and sold him for a hundred and thirty dollars. They got a check for four hundred and forty, so the check was padded out. And to these two young guys, wow, a check for four hundred and forty—that's good money, right? And this is nineteen thirty, right? Thirty-nine, right. thirty-nine. So you know, Superman—they had just published the first issue; it was selling like hotcakes. So Jerry Siegel, like, well, let's sign. And Joe Schuster, the artist said, like, well, no, let's run this by a lawyer. And Siegel said, like, no, no, let's just get the money. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm talking. So they signed. Superman, of course, went on to make billions of dollars over the last, yeah. of the next, you know, 70 years. Yeah. And they and, finally, and and uh, and the, uh, the, oh, the company DC, which was later bought by Warner Brothers, you know, yeah. very magnanimously f- – Finally gave them credit and money. They threw them a once, bone. Once a gun was inserted Basically, into their rectum. They were, shamed, <laughs> they were shamed into it. You know, yeah, it was like I mean, this. They the never mid-70s. volunteered it. <laughs> so, let, all right, let's give them, what, $30,000 and maybe a stipend for the rest of their lives. One, yeah. of them, one of them went blind. The artist, Joe Schuster, went blind. And Jerry Siegel was working as a stock clerk. You know, he was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was like pathetic. Superman. We and need those Q-tips. Irrelevant uh, connection. Joe Schuster's nephew was Frank Schuster of 1950s comedy team Wayne and Schuster. Really? And the Wayne is, of course... Johnny Wayne and Frank <laughs> not Schuster, the movie star. not the movie star, but they were the biggest comedy stars in Canada. Mm-hmm. They were Canadian yes. in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And Ed, a big influence on Lorne Michaels, I believe. Well, well his Rosie, cousin, yeah. Rosie Schuster is Frank Schuster's daughter. Right. Joe Schuster is Frank Schuster's uncle. Rosie Schuster married Lorne Michaels and was one of the first season SNL writers. writers. So yeah. there's all these kind of weird uh, connections. Yeah. 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 But I was on Talking Dead. But the, the bad guy, the bad guy's name on Mad Men now is on uh, Walking Dead now is Negan, N E G A N. And I said, if you're in, you're at the Starbucks, you're at a bus stop, you're with your friends, you're talking, and, you, and you're talking about like, how much you hate Negan, pronounce it really carefully <laughs> and don't say it fast. <laughs> yeah. And there's a, no, you can't do that. 
But what I find interesting about, you know, IFC, which is the only place um, I think you could ever have a show, excluding Stand Against Evil, but like Portlandia, a documentary now. Mm -hmm. These shows that are, thank God somebody's making these shows. Like there's, there's only a handful of shows that I really like. Black Mirror, I'll watch Black Mirror and go, God damn it, somebody knows I own a television. (laughs) <laughs> you know? they made a show for me yeah exactly nobody who else is what is the, the andy, old andy kindler joke my target audience is men my age who are me um who else is watching this um because the mo- the business model of television is eroding like the island at the end of son of kong yeah i said it um <laughs> you know and you but and you and and i and i we live through the heyday of or the, the last gasp of the old model and mm-hmm. we're at the beginning of the new model. Mm-hmm. Um, where, where, where do you pin, like, Brandon Tartikoff wrote that book, The Last Great Ride, about the, the heyday of NBC in the early 90s. You know, that was my next job after Imus. No. All right, so so I, fi- I finished with, I spent the summer with Imus. Imus disappeared halfway through the summer on a Coke jag. So we played the <laughs> wow. best of Imus for three weeks and then he came back. Wow. Uh, while he was off doing the worst of Imus. While he was, off, while he was off enjoying the worst of Imus. <laughs> and, uh, and then I went back to college. I graduated and a woman I had met who ran promotion at WNBC radio had left to go run the NBC page program. Uh, and, but I had met her during my time at the radio station and I applied to be an NBC page and, she, for some reason, looked favorably upon me, and I became an NBC page. And while I was a page, I had three assignments. My first assignment, that's what they do. Basically, you have to give tours of 30 Rock, and then after a couple months, they'll let you go on to different desks in different departments and learn all about the company. My assignments were, my first assignment was, I was the 6A page at Letterman. So I was the page who sat outside, did all the tape and holds, and did all the seats at David Letterman. This is 1988, 89. Oh, like this is the, the and, heyday of Letterman. Oh, yeah. When Letterman was the hottest show. It was across the hall right. from Live at Five in New York from the newscast. Right. And uh, so I was the 6A page. My And I got to be the receptionist at Letterman when they sent Larry Bud Melman to Tierra Del Fuego. Uh, Dave Rogalski, who became a writer, uh, right. at the time was the receptionist. He went with Larry Bud. Calvert DeForest was his real name. Right. And uh, they needed a receptionist, so I sat in there. And then- and when Cal- Here's how weird. Here's how small the world is. When Calvert DeForest in the late '80s, early '90s started to do personal appearances as a stand-up comedian, there was a college kid, but your age, who acted as his manager. That man, Tom LaSalle, <laughs> now my manager, <laughs> Fantastic. and a producer on Stand Against Evil, <laughs> and he is the son of Peter LaSalle, who produced the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and uh, and and I believe Jill Lederman. When did Jill Lederman start working at Letterman? Jill got there in ninety. 90- Ninety three. So she I think? after you'd left. After I'd left. Okay. Yeah. And then and, and our friend Jill Lederman, who later worked at Letterman for years as a producer, now uh the executive producer of Jimmy, Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel Live. That's right. And the wife of your friend and mine, Rob Cohen, the one uh, and only uh veteran of this podcast, was sitting in that chair last night, not recording a podcast, <laughs> <laughs> watching the show. That's the smell. <clears throat> That's the smell. Um but and but when you got into uh Oh, just really quickly, yeah. so I my second assignment after Letterman was SNL. I was the 8H page, and I did everyone's dressing rooms on the floor of the studio at And 8H. who was on the cast at that time? This was Phil Hartman, Lovitz, Dana Carvey, Jan Hooks, the Kevin John, Nealon. Dennis uh, Miller. Dennis, uh, a Whitney Brown. Wow. Um, and speaking of cocaine. <laughs> speaking of heroin <laughs> and cocaine. Uh, who else? Uh, Victoria Jackson, Crazy Pants. Right. Um, and, uh, who else? Who else? You said Jan Hooks. I said Jan Hooks and also Nora Dunn, obviously. Nora Dunn, right? Sisters singing act together. Right. That was when Saturday Night Live finally regained an, a sense of identity from the first, it was the, that was the next great era of SNL after the first great era. It was, to me, it was the recovery from the Dick Ebersole era. Yeah, yeah. And then, which had and it turned Lauren it into a, co- a very conventional crappy show. Right, and then it took Lauren a couple of years. Correct, and a couple of casts show. to like right. get it back on track. There was the Anthony uh, Michael Hall, Robert Downey Jr. year. Yes. 1986, well, I believe. That, no, that, that, remember, that was, oh, that's correct. That's yeah, correct. that was Lauren's first year back. That's right. That's right. Uh, that was Lawrence's first year back. And then the only surviving cast members of that year was were Dennis Miller and John Lovitz. Yep. And because it went, the show went back to its roots of seeking out improv talent right. at places like the Groundlings versus what Dick Ebersol was doing, which was great. I'll just go get the all-star team. Right. Marty Short, 
Billy Crystal, right. Chris Guest, Harry Shearer. I'll just I'll just load it up with right. the Yankees. Right. And he did, and that I think, and obviously he found Eddie Murphy, and that sustained the show right. for a while. Technically, Gene Domanian. Gene Domanian found, found Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Murphy. Yeah, but they blew Eddie up into a huge star, and that right. sustained the show as being edgy because right. there was a black guy. Because around. somebody and Eddie Murphy only got the show because Eddie Murphy was a kid. He was seventeen or That's eighteen. Right. He was in a a group. It was him. And uh, called the Identical Triplets, and it was him and two white guys, or him and a black guy, and another white guy. I'm blanking on the name of the guy. The other African American improv actor that was in that group was the one that they wanted, and the rumor is he couldn't read. <laughs> uh, and Eddie got it because the guy couldn't read cue cards. Oh my god! Uh, that might be apocryphal, but it's a very well known apocryphal story. If it is apocryphal. Uh, yeah, and it was just one of those things. You have to be there at the right time, at the right place. Yeah. Yeah. And my last assignment was I worked for Brandon Tartikoff. Worked for Brandon Tartikoff. And I was his New York second assistant. He had a full-time New York assistant. His job was sort of like mine is at IFC. I do three weeks in LA, then one week in New York every month. Brandon had a similar situation because GE had purchased uh, NBC. NBC from, from, from the RCA Corporation. RCA, right. And as a result- Is RCA still a corporation? I don't know. I don't see their brand name on any electronics yeah. anymore. It used to be on that building. It, it used was. To be on 30 Rock, right? It was. Now it says Comcast. Right. Um, as they said in The Simpsons, Vuzuvulon. <laughs> <laughs> Vuzuvulon <laughs> Stadium. I went to work for Brandon. He had a New York assistant. I was When he came into New York, they put an NBC page on his second desk. And that's how I got to know him. And I would read him the ratings every morning. As I date myself incredibly, pre-fax machine, wow. I would go market by market. There were only 22 overnight markets. Now there's 59 or something like that. Right. And I would read him market by market the numbers of how the shows did the night before. It was 6 a.m. L.A. time, 9, 9 a.m. New York time. Mm-hmm. And he once told me, he said, I'm like the GM of a baseball team. I see how my players did the night before. I bench Jake and the fat man and I move up. You know, I move up the Dick Van Dyke mysteries in the order or whatever. And, uh, Dick and, Van Dyke and, mysteries. and at one point, uh, he said to me one morning, there are, just there are a couple of, nothing, of Dick Van Dyke there mysteries. There are a couple of mysteries. <laughs> um, but he, uh, Brandon said to me, what do you want to do with your career? And I said, I want to do what you do. And he, he said, you can't do it in New York. If you want to do that, you have to come to LA. And that's how I ended up out here. Really? Yeah. I quit the page program. It was an 18 month program. I quit after nine months. Oh, really? Yeah. And did did you work for him out there as well, or I I go back they had the a, they had a program back then called the Programming Associates Program, which was a junior executive program at NBC. Uh huh. I flew out. There was only one per year in New York and one per year in L.A. I went out to L.A. I met with everyone up one side of the hallway and down the other, down memory lane. I'm right. sure this will take you. But it was Perry Simon, Warren Littlefield, Wow, yeah, uh, Jamie Tarsis. Uh, uh, Leslie Lurie, Tony yep. Masucci, Lori opened in in the casting department, et cetera. Right. Met everybody. I went back to Brandon's office. All these names later on, massively uh, successful, influential people in television. Yeah, and and developed huge hit shows. Yeah. And, uh, and I went back into Brandon's office. He said, you did great. You killed it. Everybody loved you. Go back to New York. Pack your stuff. Come on out. You'll get the gig. Fabulous. I go back to New York. I pack everything up. I move to L.A. And they gave the job to Ken Mock, uh, <laughs> who was... Bill Cosby's driver. <laughs> and at the time, Warren Littlefield looked at me and shrugged and said, NBC, nothing but Cosby. Not anymore. Not anymore. But wow. back then, they were the biggest, baddest dude on the block. Uh-huh. Yeah, they were sure. a giant hit show. And that is a great lesson about not just show business, but life. You got fucked. And the attitude is, yeah, you got fucked. Yeah. That's what that happens. was a really good lesson in yeah, showbiz, and I was by like, the way. That's that, and and to this day, that's how the game goes. Yes, and if you more often than not, right? And I know people who are so smart, who are so smart, but not smart enough to realize that this is a political business and a bureaucracy, and it is completely amoral. Mm-hmm. And they consistently are morally outraged. And devoid of logic. This non-meritocracy is not a meritocracy. Evolution does not favor the strong. Evolution mm-hmm. favors those mo- most adaptable to change. Correct. And that is why you, you know, and I, I, I have a very privileged 
view of this because my ex-wife of years was a, a, a very successful agent and then worked at, as an executive at HBO. And I have, I have been steeped in both sides of this business. I happen to know that all creative thinks all the business sides are assholes and all the business sides thinks all the creatives are crazy mm -hmm. and they're both right and they're both wrong. Correct. <laughs> you know, exactly. Uh, yeah. They're, they're, they're both a little right and they're both a little wrong, but it's always like, yeah, no, that's how this works. Now was the Iger, uh, the Iger Eisner. Uh, they did, They ran a studio, right. You know, one of the shops. No relation to Bob Iger, Michael I Eisner? Don't think. No, no, different spelling. Different okay. spelling. No, no, Will Eisner, no relation to uh, to um, Michael Eisner. As far as I know, right. although Michael Eisner wound up running the Tops Company, of all things, you know. Uh, oh, that's The Bubblegum Company, yeah, became like, you know, the head of that. So, but still, it doesn't tie into Will Eisner. Just, a, you know, another Jewish name that, you know, right. has been used over now, and over. Not in your book, but I wanted to ask you, because you were talking about Jules Pfeiffer, who... What is the origin of Herb Block? Oh, well, let's talk about more the political cartoons, but his name was Herb, Herbert mm -hmm. Block. And that's basically combine okay. that, you know, just to shorten the name, I right. guess. And, and it had a ring, you know. And sure. He was one of the great, you know, political cartoonists of, of his era. But people Although, don't realize how that influences people's perception. Herb Block very famously started, would always draw Nixon with a five o'clock shadow. Yeah. Well, he maybe was the first guy to do that. He was. In the fifties. Purportedly. And he was the guy that really cemented the idea that Nixon was a shifty uh, yeah. character that couldn't be trusted. He's the first guy to draw Joe McCarthy with a five o'clock shadow yeah. too. And yeah. Actually, I have some Herb Block books from the fifties and I look at them occasionally. And aside from Nixon, Eisenhower and Joe McCarthy, I don't know who anybody is. <laughs> maybe, maybe John Foster Dulles. He's in yeah. there too. And a couple of names you kind to know but well, it's just like you know which is why one of the reasons i never really got into political cartooning because the day after it becomes like you know it's well, just that, like that, yesterday's it's news. the problem with listening to mort saul records you need to read the autobiography you know, of adlai stevenson <laughs> exactly or even to catch like, all the jokes nobody, even some lenny bruce stuff like people wonder what offends me governor forbus yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard it's like you, you make <laughs> you know, what? What? <laughs> the work i did for spy magazine i it's like nobody can relate to any you know michael milken or yeah. uh, or uh, Lee Atwater and you know right. these guys who are dead. Or, well, there's yeah. a reason that even a great show like The Daily Show with John short, Stewart, who is the short fingered vulgarian, you are well, always him, making he's fun completely of. Completely forgot. <laughs> you know, people have asked me, I completely forget that guy's name. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can't put that kind of stuff on a DVD. You can't watch The Daily Show from 2002, no matter how brilliant no, the jokes yeah. are, because it has no shelf life. Yeah. Right. George Carlin never did that sort of Mort Saul day to day stuff. He called it layups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, totally. oh, I'm, no, I'm playing the game. I'm not shooting layups. Well, also as a comedian, it's so hard to come up with material it's a tragic that you have to throw it out after a week if yeah, it's yeah, a great it joke becomes, that's only referential yeah, you know? that's why it's so much fun to watch the yeah. honeymooners because there's no topical references occasionally from marilyn monroe's name being mentioned or something yeah it's just like it could all take place today it could all take place today. and there's certain movies too that are just like uh utterly contemporary mm -hmm. like bonnie and clyde could have been made today the film nothing sacred mm -hmm. which is an amazing film mainly for its cast but for a lot of reasons but it's as topical as ever that frederick march carol yeah, uh, yeah. carol lombard so it's, it's a preston sturgis uh, screenplay yeah uh, right. ben, Hecht, ben Hecht, Ben Hecht, I think. Oh, is it? Yeah, Ben Hecht and William Wellman directed. But the but the the supporting cast: Hattie McDaniel, Bobby Barber. Do you know Do you know Bobby Barber? I don't know. I know okay. Hattie McDaniel. You know him by Bob he's a little bald guy. Used to be on the Abbott Costello show. Okay, he never okay. spoke really. But and uh, you know, Billy Barty's in that film. Wow. And uh, and uh, what's his name? The the the, the Jewish wrestler. Um, I forget his name. No, boxer. I'm sorry, Maxi Rosenblum. Yeah, oh, it was yeah. an amazing cast. You can just watch this film and just enjoy, enjoy the cast. Who's more entertaining than Billy Barty? Nobody. Also around, and also uh, had an amazing long career. Yeah, it was, he old, died. He was like th 321 when he died. <laughs> well, he started playing babies, you know, and he continued playing babies, and you know, I think it, yeah. when he was still a teenager. Yeah, he's in Weird Al's movie UHF yeah. as a cameraman. Right. Who, who wow. Never get the angle right. right, you know. And he's in Mickey Maguire comedies with Mickey Rooney when he was like, you know, uh, okay. three or four. Wow. Yeah. Speaking of Billy Barty, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I guess we call a little person now. Yes. I'm trying to keep up with my, my, you know, look, look at me and my height privilege. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have to ask you, Drew, please tell us about what is oh. Super Pup? 
Well, Super Pup was created by Whitney Ellsworth, who is the producer of the Superman TV series. Right. He had actually worked for National Comics in New York, and he became the liaison between New York and Hollywood when Superman, when they decided to expand Superman to right. movies. And what's interesting, just to give it like a historical perspective, like now, you know, in the 50s, in the, in the late 40s and the 50s, during what we call the golden age of comic books, you know, all of these guys, they were, these are adult men. They were all, you know, you read your book, you realize all of these guys were in the Marines in World War II. <laughs> like, everybody served in World War II. Mm-hmm. They, they were real men. Right. And then they came back and they're, they're writing comic books and they're drawing and inking comic books. And it's this little, not very well regarded industry. It's sort of like this weird right. closet industry that people didn't pay attention to. I'm sure these people would be at a, dinner party what do you do you write comic books really a lot of them kitty were, books they were embarrassed to mention that yeah like, what kind you're a writer well yeah, yeah. but then it's like well what kind but but yeah, now, there is you're right 95 percent of these guys like there's a lull in their careers for five, four or five years in the mid in the early mid 40s and then they yeah. come back right they either resume the comic book career or like mickey spillane they start writing novels right or, Ray or, Bradbury or, or patricia yeah. highsmith yeah. starts you know wrote strangers on the train after yeah. writing for more for uh, timely comics in the early 40s right and she also wrote the price of salt yeah, yeah. that became Under a different name Right, right. Uh, right. Uh, I forget the name, but it beca- that book became Carol later. Right. But what's amazing is, so you have these guys working in uh, this sort of weird minor industry, and now it is 80% of the motion picture industry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> comic book movie if your movie does not have a superhero in it you yeah. can't get it made yeah um, and i don't see any of those films i have little interest in them i'm yeah. interested in like the origins of how that's how it sprang up and yeah whatnot. what about you, superman meets the mole man well that like sort right. of triggered the two the superman tv series produced by whitney ellsworth it became starring, a huge hit one, george of the, reeves. one of the biggest hit uh, hit shows of the 50s if i'm not mistaken starring george reeves jerry Marin and billy Barty, i believe play mole men yeah in yeah. it it's all again the little but people tying that tie, tying into that you asked about super pup superman right. was so popular they said well, why don't we do a version of, of superman for kids for little kids so they had somebody had the idea probably whitney ellsworth who was a clever guy said why don't we, why don't we like, make them dogs how do we do that you know with their speaking dialogue but it's the, basically the same that we have a clark kent we have a superman a jimmy olsen lois lane perry white why don't we get higher little midget higher midgets little midgets that's redundant <laughs> Hire midgets and build these fiberglass dog masks. Huge midgets. <laughs> How about, yeah, a novelty. So they built these fiberglass dog masks and put them on these midget heads and then dubbed in dialogue from uh, from other actors, like, you know, kid. And then. Um, and you can see this. It, yeah, it you is can on see, YouTube. It's on YouTube. There yeah. was only one one episode film, The Pilot, and it's. it's it's fun. It's the strangest, possibly one of the strangest pilots ever. Made. It, yeah, it is. It, that, and that's the really important thing. Like, this is one of the weirdest things you'll ever see, and it's from like 1955, <laughs> right, maybe. Right, right. When, when Superman was huge, yeah. and it's one of those shows, you're like, what were they thinking? You know, right. It was like basically like, you know, like the little girl uh, that – the the uh, sitcom pilot you were circulating of the uh, the Eloise the variation of Eloise with the hipster parents yeah oh, yeah the yeah. beatnik the sitcom yeah, yeah the produced yeah. by Lucille Ball and yeah Desi, Desi Lou what yeah. were they right. thinking yeah yeah which I love right. we love what were they thinking yeah Anything. well and and that's called and uh, you you had uh, sent this around in our little uh, email cabal um uh the 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 title of it is. Which, the beatnik? The, I, yeah. I don't remember what it's it was called, a, but it's 19, about a, it's like a six-year-old beatnik is it girl. Her, her name? Like her? Yeah, it's, it's not Eloise, yeah. but it's Eloise. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's Something girl like and it's, it's instead of a girl in the Upper uh, West Side, in a, a yeah. apartment, she's, she lives in Greenwich Village. Her, uh, she's a beatnik kid, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, like, it's like junior beatniks. It's like beatnik babies, basically. But the funny thing is, because it's produced uh, by Desi Lu, which was never on the cutting edge of what was going on in America, really. Despite no. all their successes, it was kind of a square, old-fashioned sure. uh, outfit. Uh, like the beatnik episode of My Three Sons, it's made like in the 60s. <laughs> sure. It's not made in the 50s. So uh, they're right, getting yeah, in yeah. on the beatnik train nice. when it's yeah. already It's like hippies, hippies in 73. Well, it's like yeah, Rob, yeah, yeah. Rob Reiner playing a hippie on Gomer Pyle. Right, right, right. Yeah, I also think, <laughs> did he also put one on Dragnet? Is that the famous? I think he did show up yeah. on Dragnet. So yeah. The, yeah, yeah. That was the babies in the oven. Marijuana. That was yeah. Blue Boy is the famous episode of Dragnet sixty seven right. where the yeah. kids freaking out on LSD and Jack Webb yeah. and Harry Morgan find this kid in the park with his head buried in the sand like yeah. an ostrich because yeah. he's tripping on ass. You think you're pretty far head. out, don't you, son? <laughs> I think that was the pilot to the second series that they started in this yeah. late sixties. Oh, and you know, whenever they I kicked get- it off. When I didn't get that gig, Brandon turned to me and said 
go go home, write a letter that makes it sound like you ran GE, and I'll sign it, and I'll send it to every showrunner we have. And he did, true to his word, and that's how I became a PA on the Golden Girls. You wrote a letter. I wrote a letter that basically said Pete Aarons is a genius. He ran the missile division and the oh, train you division. Wrote a letter for Brandon. For Brandon to sign. To sign. And then Brandon sent it to every showrunner who had a show on NBC. The problem was I had moved out so late in the year, they'd all hired everybody already. Right. So the gig I got was at Whit Thomas Harris, Susan Harris, who created the Golden Girls. Moistening uh, room of Clanahan's loins. <laughs> better her than BR. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I got a job as a PA on the Golden Girls from the letter that I wrote and Brandon, and to be fair, Warren Littlefield signed it also. Right. Brandon, by the way, but I also, I did a pilot with Brandon Tartikoff after he left NBC when he was on that first new thing that Kathy Clovis created. Really? Yep. Me, Kathy Clovis created it, and it was Gina Gershon and myself as brother and sister, Mm -hmm. and it was Brandon's first thing with his new company. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the name of his company, by the way? I want to say it was like Apple or something like that, but it wasn't. H period Beal. Howard Beal. Beal. Right. It was the H dot Beal company. That's pretty great. Howard Beal. What I remember was. We did uh, 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 when he called me to tell me that I got the part. I was in my apartment. I live in Santa Monica. I only live in Santa Monica one year, so this is nineteen ninety four. Mm-hmm. Uh, my phone rang. I was on the phone. I think with a, with probably with, probably on the phone with Rob Cohen. And I was like, Bring, uh, "Hang on a minute." I just went. I'll be right with you. I'm just wrapping up a call. Like <laughs> not not even saying hello. Not even saying hello. And I go, and I go, I, as somebody's on the line, I got to get it. Hello, Dana, Brandon Tartikoff. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. He goes, it's all right. I haven't been on hold since 1976. <laughs> he was a truly lovely guy. And yeah, a that's what it is. A, a really, like a gen, he's a very powerful guy. Witness the fact I lost out and he made sure I got a gig because he, he made, knew I'd moved out here for it. did not have to do anything. Didn't. And was just a mensch. Was fabulous. In yeah. those days, they used to literally write out by hand the scheduling, and it was sort of top secret because you didn't want ABC to find out right. how you were going to counter program the James Bond movie or whatever. Right, right, right. With the Geraldo Satan special. And uh, he used to hand me the, they called them the squares, and uh, because they were laid out in block form on long pieces of paper. Right. And he, sa- he used to say to me, he'd hand them to me and go, here, make six copies of this and don't read it. And when I say that, I mean read it. <laughs> and he was a genuinely funny guy and, yep. it was, and he was fabulous to work for and he really for some reason that is still unbeknownst to me took a shine to me and was great to me in my career he, in, the, in the brief time that I, I worked for him he was lovely and, and, and that is you know did you read the story recently about that Walmart uh, recently like Walmart has had a boom in productivity uh, their stores were like dirty and they had low productivity and people were starting to go because it was they were getting bummed out mm-hmm and now they have this thing. The stores are cleaner. The staff is uh, much more helpful. And as a result, uh, increased productivity and, and people are coming there more. You know why? They started paying their employees more. <laughs> and people actually felt good about going to work. Huh. And That's people, interesting. It's such a weird thing that when people feel appreciated – they do a better job. It's very interesting. But but you would be surprised at the people that don't get that. I know. It sounds like a Harvard Business School case study. Yeah. As if you had to discover that. Which apparently you <laughs> they do. did. Yeah. yeah. Walmart did. Never mind the just the human nature aspect of it. Like why you know, we treat people shitty because we can. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it takes just as much to not treat people shit, you know. Yeah. You know, um, it's actually easier to be nice to people because you're not always going, is he going to be there? Is he going to be there? Yeah. Is he going to be there? Yeah. Um, but that was- It's you know, actually the path of least resistance. Totally. Totally. It's like I tell my kids, you want to make friends, ask people about themselves and listen. And sit back. Exactly right. Yeah. It's it's so easy. Yeah. It's, well, look what I do for a living. <laughs> look at this trip. Piece of shit. Um, and so then you, you know, you, you- where the gold, you know, the Golden Girls, which, which people fucking love that show. It's, it's insane. I don't think I've ever seen it because this is what year is this? Eighty eight. I went. To, no, I went to work there. 
Yes, end of 89, beginning of 90. 90. Okay, I was doing stand-up comedy every night back then. You were, that's when I met you. Right, and I was not home watching the Golden Girls. I'll pinpoint it for you. Do you remember when you signed at Triad? With Bill Gross and Mike August, who yes. is now the producer of the Adam Carolla podcast? Correct. Bill Gross is in heaven? Yes. Do you well, remember when you signed with them? Well. <laughs> well. <laughs> that's not confirmed. Uh, that's yeah. when I met you. Yes, yes. And... You were, were your offices? We were on the Renmar lot on Coenga. Right, you came right, to right, right. Me, and you met me in David Himmelfarb's That's office. I, mean. I do remember that. I do remember that. I remember that meeting. And you were on your way to San Francisco yes. that day to go do, do To do a up. gig. And mm-hmm. I, I, I remember that meeting. And we talked about you had an idea that you pitched to me that was basically a sketch show based on – uh, the different channels of like a television monitor. Yeah, it was called. I wrote it with Jeff Schaefer and Alec Berg, and it was called the Who, Channel Surfer. Right, and the Who conceit was it was the Night Watchman at Pan, yes. Pan Galactic Mega Cable Vision, and he just sits there and flips channels, and each time he flips, it's a sketch. Right, that was the lame. Attempt that was the, it was the thing. we sold it to NBC, and Berg and uh, Schaefer went on to uh, work Berg and Schaefer. Went on to work on Seinfeld, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Jeff Schaefer did The League. Alec Berg does Silicon Valley. And a bunch of, funnily enough, a bunch of those sketches ended up on SNL because when the show didn't go, we sent it to Dave Mandel and he took it apart. He was writing at SNL because, you know, he was Jeff and Alex's right, 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 best right. friend from college. So since the show wasn't going, we sent the script to Mandel and Mandel did a bunch of this, a bunch of the sketches oh, that's up on really, SNL, <laughs> that's which right. I thought was hilarious. Yeah. But I know people that grew up like, you know, straight men. That love the Golden Girls. Yeah. Just like, I don't know what. Yeah. It was an astoundingly popular show. Astoundingly. Yeah. The first week I worked there, it did a 43 share. Which today. Which is ungodly. Shows shows now are considered hits with a, a 9 or a 10 share. Yeah. That's literally, is a 43 share 43% of the people watching television are watching the Golden Girls? Yes. Well, yes. And it wasn't broken down demographically at that point. So it was right. really just 43% of the households using televisions, HUT, the hut level. Right. Households using televisions, 43% of them were tuned to the Golden Girls. That's unbelievable to me. Well, it was a four network universe. Also. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Fox. Fox wasn't even, they were programming one yeah. night a week. Yeah, yeah, they were programming one night a week. And it was uh, uh, Herman's Head, uh, which I was the line producer on. And what was the. There was Herman's Head. There was – Whoops. Uh, well, I was the line producer on that too. But uh, what was that the, wasn't on Fox. Max Headroom was the show. Max I Headroom was on. Yep. Um, and – Max they, Headroom they was married, huge. They had Married with Children. Married with Children. Um, Max Headroom was huge. Max Headroom was huge. Matt Frewer. Matt Frewer. And remember he got his own show, Doctor yes, Doctor. That's right. Which was a good show. Which was a really good show. Had a yeah. fabulous staff. Yeah. Norman Steinberg was the head writer. Roberto Benabib was on that staff. There were yep. a lot of really good writers on that staff. It's amazing when you look like, you know, television like anything else, it's, you know, it's, it's the same hundred people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you see these people moving throughout their career. Now, you were talking about like Berg and Schaefer, who mm-hmm. I, we both know very, very well. They wrote on Herman's head. They wrote on her, we, we both, I, I auditioned to play Herman. I auditioned to play Herman, and, and um, I was one of the 11 jobs that I lost to Billy Ragsdale. Billy Ragsdale. I would walk in. I would walk into an audition. That's no claim to fame. I would walk I into an audition. Billy Ragsdale. I would walk into an audition, see Billy Ragsdale, and, go, Ugh. <laughs> and then, uh, and I was somebody reminded me the other day because I had totally forgotten about this. I was in the final mix for the lead for the. Uh, Brent Fraser role in Encino Man. Oh my God. Which I totally to forgot. To play the Pro Magnet Man? Yeah. I totally forgot about that. Oof. And I like test that. Like I went right down. Whenever I get irate at what I view as the excesses of millennial culture, right. I always have to check myself yes. and go, I'm just Joe Friday. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, when stand-up comedians com- complain about political correctness, yeah. all I can hear is Bob Hope complaining about hippies. Yeah. Because that's what it sounds mm. like to me. You're complaining about the attitudes of a new generation that's younger than you, that is educated in a different way, that has progressed under a different yeah. culture than you did in the 60s or 70s or 80s. So, And Bob Hope, especially... The there's a couple of jokes that Bob Hope had that I was just was reading these like, you know, the, how our culture has changed. 
These are two Bob Hope jokes. One, this one's from 1975. Hey, I was just out in California where they made homosexuality legal. <laughs> I left before they made it compulsory. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and then Which is a, actually not a bad joke. Right, but, but the fact that he, they made it legal right. is what's bizarre nice. about that joke. Yeah. And the other one was, uh, uh, I don't know the complete joke. I bet you know it. Uh, uh, it was from the 80s. It's a Bob Hope special in the 80s where he goes, hey, I hear the Statue of Liberty caught that AIDS bug. Oh, my God. Uh, and it's something, something, wow. something, the Holland Tunnel. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> Is this the show you, you were on? As no, one of the that, new was, young that was 10 years later. Oh, that was 1994. Okay. Oh, my God. You know, I yeah. saw, Caught I, that AIDS bug. Bob Hope nice. came to my hometown <laughs> in Canada. In 1991, Bob Hope played this music festival in Canada, and he was doing stand-up. He must have been 90-something at yeah. that point. Now, the important detail to this story is that he was in Canada. Right. He comes out on stage. He goes, boy, how about a tribute to our, this great country of ours? Oh, all 50 states are just so great from Hawaii to Alaska. And everybody's like, wait, you're in Canada. Bob Hope. Forgot. Yeah. He had no idea where he was. Yeah. Just came in off a plane, did the show, got on a plane nice. and left. You know, That's he didn't amazing. know where he was. I think, yeah. I think when Ringo, when they took the Beatles to Washington after playing uh, in New York, when they arrived in uh, New York. For in the, 64? In Sullivan. Yeah. He didn't know he was in Washington. He said, where am I? There's a film of it. It's like, what town is this? I don't know where I am. You know, it's like, it's <laughs> Kind of, well, well, that's his first time in the, America. The Beatles in America, the Albert Mazel's film, is one of the all-time greatest films ever. Is that the one, the documentary where they're just on the train with them? Yeah, black and white. Yeah, 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 and yeah. Like They're in the hotel room, and Ringo's got this transistor radio, and you hear them listening to the commercials, and they're just... Yep. right. You just see them in the raw, with no narration, mm -hmm. just total cinema yep. verite, fly on the wall, and yep. they could not be more charming. And I believe... The reason they made Hard Day's Night was kind of based on that film because they showed them naturally being so charming and funny. They right. thought they could recreate that with mm -hmm. Richard Lester, which they did, you right. know, quite successfully. Did they, sure. uh, uh, yeah, did you see the, the Ron Howard, uh, documentary? Not yet. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's great. It, it's very entertaining. And believe it or not, there's stuff there that you haven't seen before. Right. I was wondering amazing. that, but it looks like it's widescreen. I guess it looks amazing, right? It's amazing. It like and truly what's, what I found was amazing was, the uh the Shea Stadium concert, uh you you realize how terrifying that must have been for them. I mean, because they were at the center of Shea Stadium, and no, they, those kids were not in control of themselves. Right, and if they rushed the stage, those guys were dead. Yeah, I mean, and they're know, they're not just in front of them; they're behind them as well. Right? Yeah, it's like yeah, they're, they're all over, and you just see the the cameras on the stage, and just this wall of, <laughs> and they couldn't hear any. You know, they couldn't hear themselves; they couldn't do anything. But well, it was just does, it must have been really scary. Does Marty Allen wind up in that film? You know, I would I would look for Marty Allen and Frank Gorshin and and Mitzi McCall and Charlie Brill. And, yeah, you know, Frank Frank Gorshin kills on. His episode, he's excellent. Uh, of Some the, of his best. show with the Beatles, the other right. comedians all bomb because, and the story is well, all the kids only wanted to see the Beatles. But if right. you watch the episode with Frank Gorshin, of course they still only want to see the Beatles. But Gorshin destroys. He was. His, he does Burt Lancaster, Kirk Douglas, uh, uh, Rod Steiger. It's, he's brilliant. Mitzi McCall and Charlie Brill. That's the painful moments, right? You know, well, they that's do from like the February '64. That's the first one. Correct? Yeah, the first one. Right. And they were like of, at the time the poor man's nickels and May right. anyway. Yeah. But they just don't get a single laugh. The audience, you know, the girls in the audience, they just want to see the. Yeah, there, 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 was a, there was also uh, directly after that a whole genre of anti Beatles comedy. Sure, and of comedy course. records. Alan Sherman had a song that was set to "Pop Goes the Weasel" called "Pop Hates the Beatles." Yep. And, and who was buying that? Kids or old, it, old people? I, I, I was the target. <laughs> Audience yeah, there. exactly. Yeah, was the biggest act in you know the well, world. There is a look. Uh, whenever it's one thing, you know, whenever you get a bad review, uh, it's always great to go back and read the reviews of the Beatles on yeah. Ed Sullivan. Yeah, because they're all they they don't know what music is. Yeah, like they're nice. just so brutal. But there's a joke in Goldfinger. Uh, mm -hmm. where he goes, uh, it's something to the effect of a drinking Don Perignon at room temperature is like listening to the Beatles the without Beatles. earmuffs. Oh I remember God. that. <laughs> no, and I remember that joke, spe joke specifically, and I always wondered why Paul McCartney would write the, the, the title song to Live and Let Die, like after that insulting joke about his I, band. I don't think they care. Like, I guess not. It was for the money. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah whatever. <laughs> whatever. Chico, Chico needed the money. Have you guys ever seen the episode of What's My Line, where the mystery guests are Lieber and Stoller, the great pop music songwriters no. who wrote Hound Dog and a million yeah. rock songs in the Brill Building? 
um, they the panel gets stomped, and they say, well, these are the people that write uh, Elvis Presley's music. Bennett Cerf, who was the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> Bennett Cerf! I can see it coming. Yeah, yeah. the publisher of Random House, the squarest yeah. man alive, yeah. who used to publish jokes or a book, book of jokes that said how to how to get laughs at parties and it's right, all yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. he was not a yeah, funny person no, no. but he prided himself Toastmaster books and he had a list like this John uh, may we have a conference you know and <laughs> so they announced Lieber and Stoller and, and uh, um, Bennett Surf goes uh, do you boys ever consider writing anything other than rock and roll and uh, they said well we haven't done that yet he goes well maybe one day you'll write real music uh, <laughs> right. I mean, they had like five of the top ten hits on the charts I at the know, time, uh, but so insulting and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. condescending and just yeah. unbelievable. It's like when when uh, 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 Paul, uh, who's the guy in prison now, the uh, music producer from the early '60s, Phil Spector. Phil yeah, Spector. Spector was on with William B. Williams on his show on WNEW years ago. And uh, uh, Phil Spector says, well, why don't you play my music on any of your shows? He says, I only play good music. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Phil Spector was one of the people that helped uh, pay for Lenny Bruce's funeral. That's along, right. Along with Jack Benny and George Burns. Well, you still like him did back Jack, then. Did Jack Benny uh, contribute to, George, to Lenny's funeral? Yes, he did. I yeah. did not know yeah. that. And yeah. is it true that, Bell, that Frank Sinatra really con- uh, gave Bela Lugosi money towards the end of his life? Because they didn't know each other, I don't think. I but don't I know heard that rumor that Frank Sinatra gave Bela Lugosi. Sounds plausible. Yeah, money. it sounds plausible. Okay. Yeah, all these. I didn't know the Jack Benny Lenny Bruce thing. Yeah, it's interesting because all these guys who had come up with Lenny, once he started getting busted for drugs, they would distance themselves right. from Lenny, rather than help him. So Buddy Hackett and Lenny Bruce had been best friends mm-hmm. in the early 50s. They were pot-smoking buddies, mm-hmm. and their styles were very similar for a while. Right. But when uh, Lenny got busted for drugs the first time, Buddy thought it would be bad for his career sure. to be associated with him. So he started playing golf with Alan King and Phil Foster, people like that in right. New Jersey, to become and became a Vegas comedian rather than a coffeehouse subversive comedian. So right. even when Lenny Bruce died, Buddy Hackett did not uh, help or contribute or anything. Some of the other old school guys like Shecky Green did, but when it came to his funeral, it was George Burns, Henny Youngman, Jack Benny, all these uh, styles of comedians you would not associate with Lenny Bruce, right? Who helped pay for his funeral and help out the daughter. Oh, that is, I did not know that. That's nice really, know. that's, yeah, that's Remember fascinating. When Bob Hope was once on Merv Griffin. Merv Griffin says, Who, Bob, who is your favorite comedian? Of course, Bob is everybody's favorite. Yeah, yeah. He said, uh, Lenny Bruce. And I was surprised. This is early 70s. And uh, Lenny was long dead. For like, sure. Really? Lenny Bruce? Yeah. But, well, Henny Youngman was a big defender of Lenny Bruce as well. Because when he started getting arrested, Henny Youngman said, well, where does it stop? Who's next? Mm. Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. is a great argument, of yeah. course. You know? And also, it, and it's all, you know, Lenny, Buddy Hackett is much dirtier than Lenny Bruce. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> you know, but, well, Buddy he, went there, he went and he just like yeah. switched over but like, Buddy later Hackett's, in life. Buddy Hackett's Vegas act was filthier yes. than anything. Well, that was just filthy for the sake of being filthier. Right. Like, so, but know, that's what I'm I mean. Go exactly. That's, that's the point. It's con, it's, it's the, it, it, it was the content. It was the context. It wasn't. Yeah. He was yeah. never persecuted for that. Buddy Hackett would go on stage at the midnight show completely nude. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very illegal. It's disturbing enough. Everybody else yeah. would go to jail, but Buddy Hackett got away with it because yeah. he appealed wow. to the Knicks in America. So right. it was a, yeah. you got a pass. You know? and, it, and it is amazing that like Jim Morrison never pled the Buddy Hackett defense. <laughs> why, did, why did Milton Berle never go on the stage nude? You know, I mean, you'd think that, you know, that would have never packed, go long. Packed, that, would have, <laughs> that would have packed Carnegie Hall, you'd think. Exactly. Tonight. One night or Madison Square Garden Milton someplace. Berle's we'll finally dick. see it. <laughs> but doesn't it strike you as the strangest uh, concept for a joke? Because you would make fun of a man for having a small penis. But with yes. Milton Berle, they make fun of him for having a large penis that yes. seems like something that would be like, good why would it be it's not even necessarily making fun it was like a, a, a point of of pride that the biggest penis in all of hollywood was was, was a, a jewish guy's penis the, the big roast joke was and i don't know i think many comedians did it whenever Mil- milton burrow was on the dais you don't realize it right now but there's a uh, hispanic busboy in the kitchen uh, sucking <laughs> milton burrow off <laughs> milton be sitting right next to him on the dais you know beautiful yeah. that's well, supposedly amazing. his penis was buried in a separate cast you know, <laughs> well i do zone. know a person that has seen it and it i know is, a few people and they yeah. describe and it. it is it's true yeah his penis was had they unfeasibly large? But had those people ever seen it erect? Now that makes. I don't know if it later in life it could get erect. Yeah. It didn't need to get erect. I think. Yeah. When Cliff and I did a panel with Robert Klein last and Gilbert Godfrey last month, Alan Zweibel was on the panel, and of course that came up. 
Sure. No joke. And <laughs> Alan had seen it. No joke. You know, he didn't request to see it. Milton yeah. said, do you want to see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he that's, was on, that's a, how, that's when he was on SNL that week, do you want to see it? You assume you want to see it. Yeah. Alan was like, well, no. <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, but, no. But Bill, he produced it. You know, he yeah. popped it out on the table, and there it is. And Alan said it was like, you know, it was like looked like a big beat or something. It was like beat. <laughs> It was like, uh, or a, a side of like a, like a tongue you would see in, in the, in the <laughs> in delicatessen. Deli. Yeah. No, it, uh, it had, he was uh, proud of it. It's it had his... an elbow. I, that's all yeah. I know. You never saw it? Fred, you... <laughs> no, I never saw it. But I did have, I did have a meal with Milton Berle. Uh, uh Milton, I was, I'll, I'll never, it was the strangest story. Bud Friedman, who run famous creator of the improv was charged with Milton Berle to recruit comedians to join the uh, Friars Club here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And um, this was 1991. And I was one of the people that Bud uh, said, like, come on down, we're going to, we're going to have lunch with Milton Berle and you're going to join the Friars. And uh, so I went and sat there with Milton Berle and uh, it was, I just hated it. I hated everything about it. He was smoking this awful cigar. There's no windows in the building. And all I remember was just like, um, you know, a couple of these older, I, I didn't have the, uh, um, the ironic appreciation that I would have had for it now. Right. Or the genuine appreciation right. I would have had for it now. At the time I was 27 and I was all about being 27. Right. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to get out of there. Uh, and what I remember was I had just gotten never mind the Nirvana album. And I remember like driving back to my apartment, blasting Nevermind and with all the windows down to get the cigar and the old off me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, yeah. Now I would have really, uh, I would have really appreciated, but yeah, I, I, for, I did a special with Bob Hope and I had lunch with Milton Berle. I guess I do have a connection to some of Freddie, these Freddie Roman, the patriarch sure. of the Friars Club has Who's, uh, a son, of course, is Alan, Alan Kirschbaum, Alan Kirschbaum. The, late Alan the late, great, the late, great Alan. He was uh, terrific. Uh, yeah. A sweetheart. Freddie Roman has one great joke. And it was about Milton Berle, and it was Milton Berle's cock is more popular than the rest of him. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching Cole Shack, the Night Stalker, which was uh, Darren McGavin in yes. this, and uh, 1975, ABC. My uh, uh, one of my favorite shows, a big influence on Stand Against Evil, and uh, re, re watching them around Halloween. And uh, the staff writer, David Chase. Oh, fantastic. Who, for those of you who don't know, created a little show called The Sopranos. I love hearing that stuff. Yeah. I love hearing that. And at the time, um, I, and I knew he was on that show like two years ago, or whenever it was, I was at an Emmy thing with my then, my then wife, and David Chase was there, we were obviously with HBO, and I went up to David and I went, oh, I just saw, uh, I just saw The Night Soccer the other night. And he was like, he stopped and was like, does that hold up? Like he was totally, like, he, was, he was totally into it. Like he, he did, he was not like, oh Christ, but he was like, does it hold up? Oh, that was a Darren McGavin. It was a great guy to work for. That was him and his wife's company. And he was just like, went on talking like it was anything else. It was really great. I love Darren McGavin. Yeah. When you want to meet somebody famous, the thing to do is find out something they did that's obscure that they never talk about yep. and ask them about that. And they'll talk to you forever. Definitely. Never cite the, never cite the obvious thing. Like if yeah, you meet, I, you know, if you meet Elvis, if Elvis is not dead and you meet him, don't talk to him about Graceland or ask him about karate. You know, <laughs> get the thing, the obscure thing they're into that they want to talk about. You're right. Or Cadillacs <laughs> or a jet. You know, fried peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> One of the, and this is where I made a lot of money in, in this time when I was a young comedian. You come to LA. You'd be a comedian, uh, and then you would get a pilot. Uh, uh, show business would write you a – you'd say, you're a genius, and you'd go, you're right, I am. And they would give you uh, a check. You'd get like 35 grand or something, and uh, you'd go off to write a script for – Whatever, in my case, the first one, I believe, was called Dana. With, <laughs> with an exclamation point. With Jace Richdale. Oh. Who oh. went on to The Simpsons. Absolutely. And uh, others. And other shows. The yeah. Oblongs. Yeah. Yeah. J great guy. Great guy. Um, and, and that was based on, oddly, that model was based on the success of Seinfeld. 
Would to a certain extent, I, I could say it's, it was based was it, on the success of Jack Benny. Well, I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. you can go all the way back to Jack Benny and George Burns, right? But in the modern era, Seinfeld was the uh, was the big network example of stand up comedian. We took his personality, we built a sitcom around it, and they were, he I became a star. But was, they did none of that. They only gave him a pilot because they wanted to hold him in a talent deal remember, because they wanted they, them to replace they Johnny Carson. Four specials at a time, right? It and, was it was they were it was called the Seinfeld Chronicles. It right. shot on the lot where you and I met. CBS, uh, you know, uh, Renmar, Renmar, right? The first the first six episodes, which had Fred Barron as the executive producer, because they didn't trust Larry David to right. run it by himself. Right. Uh, they shot it on the lot at Renmar. I was standing uh, outside of the building. Jerry Seinfeld had played a small but pivotal role as the governor's assistant on Benson. Benson? And he with was Robert fired Guillaume of with soap? Robert Guillaume, and he was fired after the third episode. Uh, he was? Yes. And uh, as he was walking across the lot, I was standing with Tony Thomas, Danny Thomas's son of Whit Thomas Harris fame. And Jerry looked up at us and said, hey, remember me? You fired me. <laughs> and then walked onto the soundstage where they were shooting his show. That's amazing. Yeah. To, to, and what was Tony Thomas's reaction? Tony to Thomas actually was like, ah, "Putz, he couldn't act." <laughs> <laughs> True story. It is hard. I've been fired. It's hard to take. I've it, been fired. Yeah. I found out once I got fired by the reporter who was writing the story, calling me and asking me for comment. And that's how oh, I found out oh, I was sure. getting fired. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a, it was a story. The I'll tell you the story. The reporter was Stephen Galloway at the Hollywood Reporter. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And he called me up and said, "We're going with a story tomorrow that says you're getting fired. Do you have a comment?" Wow. And I said, "No comment," and hung up. And I called my boss, who told me, "Yes, your position <laughs> is no longer tenable with the company." Wow. <laughs> yeah. We, no, I was, uh, I was on a sitcom called Working. Uh, oh, with, I remember it well. Mike without, Langworthy was a writer on it. Our buddy Fred Savage. Right, our buddy Fred Savage. Arden Marine, who Arden I met Marine, on that show, that's right. was, still was in my house last night. That was, was, a still big NBC, that was an NBC Thursday right. night comedy show. And uh, yeah. I was fired uh, off that after the first season. And he uh, <laughs> Did he go to a second season? Yeah, it did. I was replaced by Debbie Mazar, which is a natural <laughs> progression. Um, and uh, the showrunner, when he called me to she tell She did something with that character you couldn't do, let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I met it's, it's very well. Okay, I'll tell you this first. So then, the sh- and the showrunner when he when he called me to tell me I was fired, I was in the offices of Super Venture Team, which is the show that I did with Rob Cohen, which I did a voice. You did the voice on and the I came and sat and punch up. On. Yeah, which that's what I mean. Like you're to me, you're a writer that happens to be an executive. I paid. I played Quan's assistant. Quan, is a Quan? That's too much cheese. <laughs> that's too much cheese, Quan. But- Episode two of Stand Against Evil. Do you want some? No, I'm good. That's a total homage to Quan. That's too much cheese. Um, his hand pops in. That's his right. hand pops comes out. in and goes yeah, out. That's the same thing. Um, uh, they called me up to tell me I was fired. I was not coming back. And I it, it like came out. Of, I went, in the, go fuck myself, which is what I say. <laughs> what I don't know what to say. And he said, how do you think I feel? I got to make these calls. <laughs> Well, you're still getting paid. Can you think about me for a second? Yeah, can we, talk, can, can we stay on me? <laughs> can we stay on me just while I I'm didn't fired? call you to talk about you. Yeah. I we, called you to talk about me. Can we stay on me just while I'm fired? Ugh. And, uh, and, and, you know, the, and oddly, the success of Seinfeld is what really burned that into, uh, lead in terms of, of a mold of a, a business model. Sure. Sure. I, well, I would say there were there were three pieces that made that model happen: Roseanne, Jerry, right. and Tim Allen. Right. Yeah, and Home Improvement. Those three. Home Improvement was such a spectacular commercial success. I mean, spectacular. Right. right. So much money that it paid for everything else we did at Disney. Wow. Uh, and remember, Tim at that time had the number one book, the number one movie, and the number one TV show in the country. Wow. Um, Roseanne, I think because it was the first time they took a, a female stand-up, put her in the middle of the show, and the show right. was explosively successful. Yes. And – Era-defining. Era-defining. And Jerry, because I think it it broke the rules of how that was supposed to happen. Right. What you just said of they didn't really want to do it. Rick Ludwin got it in the late night and specials department. It right. was not part of the and it, Jamie uh, Tarsus, Leslie Lurie, right. and from Vicky what I, Horowitz department. From what I understand – 
The only reason he got it was they wanted to hold Jerry in a talent deal as a potential replacement for Johnny Carson. Correct. They wanted the right to use him like they were going to use Gary Shanling right. to guest right. on The Tonight Show. Right. And, and that is the so that's why it started. That's why it was in Rick Ludwin. Right. They wanted, Rick Ludwin they was wanted an executive. Jerry, was they wanted the Jerry on the reservation. Correct. They wanted him on the bench. Right. And so they gave him four specials. Right. They said they'd do them quarterly. And those were the first four episodes of what was called the Seinfeld Chronicles. Right. And then when Larry And did, remember the first one did not have Elaine. I don't remember that. Again, I was the never. Pilot. The I pilot never saw this. I was out all the time. Yeah, That's right. And, you were gigging. Yeah, and there was, and and what's also the interesting road, is and the and the notes the audience famously they the testing for Seinfeld the audience hated it. It's <laughs> horrible. And it, when uh, this house is not his house anymore, but I was once at Larry David's house in Malibu. Yeah, he had it in a frame. He has it in a frame. And he had it framed over the toilet right. in the guest bathroom. And it in hand handwritten, I don't know which executive, but handwritten across the top, it said, I'm sorry the news isn't better. Let's discuss. <laughs> and it was full of Jerry can't act. Kramer is a weirdo. Uh, George is hateful. It was it was all the stuff that you and I have have dealt yeah. with in the notes process yeah. our entire career. Yeah, uh, you know I'm just worried he's unlikable. I'm afraid the audience. You'll notice fear is the big part of all those notes. Uh, I'm oh, afraid yeah. that the audience won't like him. I'm just scared that the audience won't forgive him. I'm worried that they won't like her. Yeah, right. it's all fear driven notes. Yeah, there's no really actual discussion of that's a really good character. Don't you think we should keep that character? That's really yeah. Well, but, it, but she's so unlikable. So. Well, if you've ever have you, met, have you met half the people in this town? Have you ever eaten at Disneyland? I go you one better. I had to work at Disneyland when I was an executive at Disney. But yes. So when you eat at Disneyland, nothing is really wow. Correct. It's all macaroni and cheese, vanilla. It's it's yeah. all very, you know, it's it's bland. It's palatable. It's not offensive. You, everybody can eat it. Yes. It will never be anybody's favorite thing to eat, but nobody is going to hate it. Yes. That's how you make mass consumables. Correct. Mitch Hurwitz once uh, said to me that he described me a certain network executive who I won't say their name, but he said, you know what he does? He takes everything that's in the bottom 5% and brings it up to the middle. And then he takes everything that's in the top 5% and brings it down to the middle. Right. So that everything you're making is in that mean zone of least offensive material right. you can possibly put on the screen. Right. Now, when you and I came up in this business, that didn't matter. You had double-digit growth without lifting a finger. Right. You didn't have to do anything. Right. Uh, you just threw headcount at the problem and created more jobs for more executives. Right. Yeah, it was a crazy – Gold rush. <laughs> it was. It was. And gold rush is the right term. If you yeah. remember, there there was that period in 1990 to about 94, 95. You know, the reason Dave Chappelle calls himself Pilot Boy with his production company is because Jordan Levin and I gave him four straight holding deals at Disney. Yeah, I think I might have done four in a row myself. I mean, they didn't. I'm we no did da- a pilot I'm, with Chappelle and Jim yeah. Brewer, and then I'm we no did three Dave on Chappelle. his own, and none yeah. of them went. No, you just like, I have a, you know, I, but. I got a, yeah, I bought a car and I got my, yeah, well, the holding deals got were, my teeth fixed. And if, you re, and if you remember, simultaneous to that, uh, the arms race of the ro- the overall writer deal started. Yeah, the over, yeah. And, and I remember Jeff Schaefer. And your former wife did quite well by me. Yes, yes. <laughs> I just well, want to say. Wait, what are you saying? <laughs> Financially. <laughs> Financially. Uh, she yeah. put a lot of writers into deals at Disney. Dana Gould Hour. In 1933, Maxwell M.C. Gaines created a four-color, saddle-stitched newsprint pamphlet and inadvertently invented what would become known as the comic book. He went on to become the co-publisher of all American publications, which gave us Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, and Hawkman. In the 1940s, comic books were the most popular entertainment form in America. And because they were passed around, they reached more people than movies and television combined. After World War II, 
Comic books like movies, television, and popular literature took on a darker cast. Following the leads of film noir and the potboilers of Raymond Chandler and later Jim Thompson, crime, horror, and romance comics began to tell a tale of a darker America. Thoroughly unregulated, they provided an outlet for the anxieties many Americans were feeling. Anxieties that the button-down conformist post-war culture of the 1950s did not allow to be expressed. Not all comics, of course. M.C. Gaines sold his stake in All-American Comics and started Educational Comics, or E.C., with the sole and specific purpose of creating wholesome content for young readers. And so we got picture stories from the Bible, picture stories from American history, picture stories from science, tiny tot comics, etc. In 1947, Gaines took his wife and their friends, Sam and Helen Irwin, on a weekend to their lake house in Lake Placid, New York. It seems that Gaines' son, Bill, who was then 25 and was about to begin his final year at NYU in the hopes of becoming a chemistry teacher, was getting divorced. His mother took this as a personal affront and in an attempt to head off her imminent nervous breakdown, Max took her to the lake house for a getaway weekend. Unfortunately, while they were there, Max was killed in a freak boating accident an accident for which Bill, miles away at the time in New York, would forever blame himself. Bill's mother, Max's widow, Jessie, and Bill, now guilt-ridden and divorced, each inherited 50% of educational comics, a company Bill described as a mess of titles competing with each other to lose the most money. Running a comic book company did not come easy to Bill Gaines. He had a scientific mind, In fact, he had all the items on his desk arranged for maximum efficiency. Stapler two inches back from the blotter on the left side. Letter opener one inch to its right. Gaines hated running educational comics and spent the early part of his tenure there working on his undergraduate degree. But soon, he found himself in a meeting with an artist named Al Feldstein. Feldstein sold Gaines on a title called Going Steady with Peggy a sexed-up twist on the then-galactically popular comic book, Archie. Going steady with Peggy didn't quite work out, but Gaines and Feldstein kept at it. For the most part, copying other companies' successful comics, mixing and matching trial and error. As David Hajdu wrote in his excellent book about comic books, The Tencent Plague, the two men set about frantically copying trend after trend, Having picked up the rights to a comic series about the magician Blackstone, Gaines published a comic book called Blackstone the Magician Slash Detective Fights Crime. The cover showed a curvy redhead and a red bra and panties being menaced by an octopus while a bald Germanic-looking man aims a forty-five at her. Blackstone the Magician Slash Detective stands in the background chained to a wall. To make things more confusing, a box on screen announced and introducing the Happy Houlihans, America's craziest and most lovable family. The Happy Houlihans were then spun off into their own title, which soon became not a Western, but a Western crime series called Saddle Justice. Saddle Justice soon became a Western love series called Saddle Romances. Eventually, a guy named Sheldon Moldoff came to Gaines with the idea of creating an original comic book of horror stories. Gaines liked the idea. Now, an interesting thing about Bill Gaines, people liked working for him. Bill's father, Max Gaines, was cold and distant. Bill, on the other hand, dedicated himself to being everything his father was not. He was paternal, caring, He was supportive of his staff. According to Al Feldstein, Bill's father was a dominant tyrant who told Bill he was a useless nothing. So Bill made himself the most supportive, encouraging, understanding, loving father figure in the world. EC, now renamed Entertaining Comics, started churning out horror titles like Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror. 
The titles were a hit, and other comic book companies caught on. Eventually, close to 200 horror titles filled the comic book shelves of candy stores and the like. The more gruesome, the better. Enter psychologist Dr. Frederick Wortham, who, in 1954, published Seduction of the Innocent, in which he warned that comic books were a leading contributor to the then new and terrifying scourge of juvenile delinquency. Soon the country's newspapers were aflame with stories about the four-color plague that was destroying the flower of American youth right under its parents' noses. In this comic book is a love story, a boy and girl in love. They get married, and after an offensively lurid description, illustrated, of course, of the couple's wedding night, the book shows how the bride murders her husband by chopping his head off with an axe. This comic book describes a sexual aberration so shocking that I couldn't mention even the scientific term on television. I think there ought to be a law against them. Tonight I'm going to show you why. This led, of course, to a national hysteria. A witch hunt over the hidden evils of, well, stories about witches. Well, what about the effect of these comic books on the children? Uh, all of our testimony from psychiatrists and uh, children themselves uh, show that it's uh, very upsetting, that it has a bad moral effect, and that it is directly responsible for a substantial amount of juvenile delinquency and child crime. Are there presently comic books in publication that you feel are harmful to children? Yes. Enter Senator Estes Kefauver. In 1954, then just two years shy of his gaining a spot on the Democratic national ticket as Adlai Stevens' running mate against Dwight Eisenhower by, quite famously, doing an end run around a young Massachusetts senator, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, at the Democratic National Convention in 1956. But in 1954, Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver held Senate hearings entitled The Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency. A large part of these were dedicated to the scourge of comic books. This enraged and offended Bill Gaines, who volunteered to appear at the hearing. The following is an excerpt from Bill Gaines' testimony. He was asked, quote, If there was any limit that you would not put in a magazine because you thought a child should not see or read about it, Gaines replied, No. My only limits are bounds of good taste, what I consider good taste. There would be no limit to what you would actually put in a magazine? Only within the bounds of good taste. Your own good taste. And saleability. Yes. Kefauver moved in for what he thought would be the kill. Here is your May 22nd issue. This seems to be a man with a bloody axe holding a woman's head up, which has been severed from her body. Do you think it's in good taste? Yes, sir, I do, said Gaines for the cover of a horror comic. A cover in bad taste might be defined as holding the head up a little bit higher so that the neck could be seen to be dripping blood, or moving the body over a little further so that the neck of the body could be seen to be bloody. You have blood coming out of her mouth, noted Kefauver. A little, Gaines shrugged. After the hearings, comic book companies banded together in an attempt to placate the government by formerly self-policing in order to prevent the legislative branch of the United States government from doing it for them. Like the Motion Picture Association of America, the MPAA, which does the same thing with its self-inflicted ratings system of GPGR, thus began the Comics Magazine Association of America. And the first order of business of the CMAA was to establish a new code of standards for comic book content. And one of the first things they wanted to do, ominously for Bill Gaines, was to get the words horror and terror out of comic book titles. Gaines, who published both Vault of Horror and Crypt of Terror, rose and walked out of the meeting. Knowing of the CMAA's plan, Gaines decided to get out ahead of the story. So he called a news conference. Beating the CMAA to the punch, 
Gaines announced he was discontinuing EC's entire line of horror and crime comics. He picked up a couple of his own titles and tore them apart. He made the point of noting that none of the paranoid accusations about comic books that had been thrown about in recent months had ever been proven correct. In fact, many had been refuted by psychiatrists. But, nonetheless, Gaines decided that the time to pull the plug was now. Only a couple days later, the Comics Code was announced and put into effect, entailing a total of 41, quote, requirements, quote, Among them, police, judges, and government officials could never be presented in a way that would engender disrespect for authority. All lurid, gruesome, and unsavory imagery had to be eliminated. The words horror and terror could not appear in a comic book title, etc., etc., etc. Meanwhile, Gaines and Al Feldstein were working on their new direction of clean comics, with mixed and dubious results. One such title was Incredible Science Fiction. In one issue, they had a story about mutants. The story was presented to the CMAA's head, Charles Murphy, who rejected it outright, saying, You can't have mutants. Now, the word mutants does not exist in the comics code, but nonetheless, Murphy kicked the story back. So Gaines went into his trunk and pulled out another story called Judgment Day about an astronaut from Earth who journeys to a planet of self-replicated robots. The robots are all identical, except for the fact that some are blue and some are orange. The astronaut then learns, to his horror, that the orange robots have been subjugated by the blue robots to a life of poverty and servitude, even though, underneath the color, they're all the same. The astronaut is justifiably outraged, and to punish the planet, refuses to accept it into the Galactic Union. He then returns to his spaceship and removes his helmet. It is only then we see that the astronaut is black. Judgment Day is a nifty little Twilight Zone-like story with a positive message condemning segregation and racism. But when Charles Murphy of the CMAA saw it, he said only one thing. You can't have... And here I'm going to use the term he used, since it was politically correct at that time. You can't have a Negro. Gaines said, Where in the code does it say that I can't have a Negro? Murphy stood fast. You can't have a Negro. So Gaines said, Fine. I'm going to hold a press conference, and I'm going to say the comic book authority is racist and will not let black people have equal depiction. So Murphy thought about this, and he said, Okay, you can have him. But you can't have him sweating at the end. The script had described beads of sweat on the astronaut's skin, quote, twinkling like distant stars. Murphy's note had no basis in anything other than the fact that, goddammit, he was the comic authority and he was going to fuck with this thing one way or another, and that was that. Or was it? Bill Gaines cleared his throat and said, fuck you, and hung up. And that was his last act as a comic book publisher. As a comic book publisher, he did have another title. It started as a comic book, created with Harvey Kurtzman. But in 1955, he changed it from a comic book to a magazine format, expressly to escape the censorship and interference of the comics code. It was titled simply Mad. Mad Magazine. I mentioned before that the final responsibility for the control of crime and horror comics rests with you. A few cities have already done something about them, not too many, but a few. Legislation against unfit comic books is possible. Legislation that won't interfere with the rights of a free press. Contact your city officials. Let them know how you feel about the crime and horror comics. And remember this. America is the richest country in the world. We're the world's biggest producer of goods. But our most important commodity, the one commodity we can't put a price tag on, is our children. Now, say you want to read more about this. Well, the entirety of the information in this story came from David Hajdu's brilliant book, The Ten Cent Plague, an exhaustive and entertaining history of the comics and the perils of the comics code and the CCMA. 
There's also Cliff Nesteroff's brilliant The Comedians and Drew Friedman's Heroes of the Comics, Volumes 1 and 2. How do you acquire these beauties? You clicky-clack your keyboard to danagool.com. Click on our Amazon banner and shop away. You get what you want, and for no extra charge, we get a couple extra beans to keep the lights on around here. Also on the homepage of danagool.com, you'll see options to donate to the show or subscribe through PayPal. Every cent goes back into the show. Please know we appreciate what, if anything, you can do. But that's not all. You can also visit our store at ComedyFilmNerds.com. We have Bevilacqua Heating and Air Conditioning t-shirts, Dana Gould Hour t-shirts, signed vinyl copies of Funhouse, Let Me Put My Thoughts in You, and soon the vinyl release of I Know It's Wrong. There's also signed CDs, DVDs, posters, pickles, all signed by me, just in time for your holiday gift giving. And all available at store.comedyfilmnerds.com. <sighs> After pimping out all that shit, I'm tired. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the average price. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing the savings directly on to the consumer. The Casper mattress is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Mattresses can often cost well over $1,500. But a Casper mattress costs just $500 for a twin size, $950 for a king. It combines springy latex and supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep service with just the right sink and just the right bounce. And all Casper mattresses are made right here in America. Time Magazine named it one of the best inventions of 2015. An award-winning mattress that won't disappoint. Why not try Casper for 100 nights, risk-free, in your own home? If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting Casper, C-A-S-P-E-R, dot com, forward slash Dana, and using the promo code Dana. Sure, you get yours and enjoy it now. Hallelujah! It's the Dana Gould Hour. Listen all the time and give us all your money. That's all we ask. You know Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner and Blitzen. But do you recall the most psychologically damaging holiday special of all? Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, a stop-motion carnival of intolerance which premiered on NBC in 1964, based on the Gene Autry song of 1949, which was in turn based on a children's book from 1939, Rudolph, along with A Charlie Brown Christmas, is one of the most beloved and fondly remembered Christmas specials of all time. But when was the last time you actually watched it? Because when you revisit the show as an adult, it is darker and weirder than a goddamn Fellini film. Rudolph tells the story of Santa's ninth reindeer, who, unlike the other reindeer on Santa's team, suffers a birth defect. His nose glows. But, since this is Christmas Town, after all, dedicated to sharing and caring and goodwill towards men, one would guess that everyone is kind and understanding. No. He's got a shiny nose. Well, we'll simply have to overlook it. Now, how can you overlook that? Nice. Well, his parents may think he's a freak, but certainly Santa Claus will understand. After all, he is a saint, right? Saint Nick? Great bouncing iceberg. Now, I'm sure it'll stop as soon as he grows up, Santa. Well... Let's hope so if he wants to make the sleigh team someday. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't want someone with a birth defect working for me. I guess you have to be genetically flawless if you're going to drag my fat ass around the globe in a toy-laden sleigh. But that's just the start of it. 
Eventually, Rudolph's father makes him wear a fake nose to hide his real one. I don't want to. Daddy, I don't like it. You'll like it and wear it. Oh, but Daddy, it's not very comfortable. There are more important things than comfort. Self-respect. Santa can't object to you now. What a great lesson for children. Hide. Hide your shame. You're worse than that wheelchair kid down the street. It sickens me they let him out in public. If he was my son, I'd make him walk. And the other reindeer are no better. Stop calling me names! Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer! (laughs) Donner, you should be ashamed of yourself. That was Santa. You should be ashamed of yourself. How dare you have a child that looks different? Look at you, Donner. You call that a deer penis? I say it's a freak maker. From now on, gang, we won't let Rudolph join in any reindeer games, right? Right, 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 right. <laughs> Now, where have we heard that level of tolerance before? And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Eventually, Rudolph hooks up with an elf named Hermie, who was also a misfit. You see, Hermie, it turns out, doesn't want to make toys. He wants to be homosexual. But since it was 1964, they used a subtle code. Someday, I'd like to be a a dentist. Right. Dentist. Wink, wink. Confirmed bachelor. Dentist. We all know the code words. Well, Hermie and Rudolph get fed up with Santa, the reindeer, and the rest of Christmas Town's bigoted pricks. So they do what any self-respecting mutant and his closeted gay dwarf toy-making companion would do. They hit the road, ending up eventually, or perhaps inevitably, on the island of misfit toys. Now, what Fever Dream produced this segment, we'll never know. But apparently, the network thought it provided a great lesson for kids. If you're different, in any way, you should be punished. Even if it's just something mild. My name is... Don't tell me. Jack. No, Charlie. That's why I'm a misfit toy. Really? Seems kind of harsh. But you do have the wrong name, so maybe you should go live on an island somewhere. You know, like a leper. After enduring this waking nightmare, Rudolph finds himself back home, facing down his tormentors, who present him with an interesting offer. Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? You see, there's a terrible storm. A storm so brutal they want to cancel Christmas. But instead, they're just going to stick Rudolph out front. See, that's the best way to apologize to someone after you've exiled them. First out the door on the suicide mission. Now, one may wonder why Rudolph went along with this deal. Here's clinical psychologist Dr. Jeff Gardier. Victims of Stockholm Syndrome develop compassion and loyalty towards their captors. And there you have it. Okay, Rudolph, full power. I eat popcorn. Everybody eats popcorn. She tastes real nice. Get yourself some now at our refreshment stand. And now, on with the show. When Howard Stern hired me to to draw to do the illustrations for his first book, Private Parts, he had a right. chapter about Milton Berle in the book. Simon Schuster was published. Now, for those, and that's a great just to to to, to put a pin in this for people who uh, are, are are unfamiliar with your work uh, by name, they know it. And a great example would be if you own Howard Stern's Private Parts. That style of drawing that's it's quasi photorealistic, yet it's still a caricature. Right. Uh, that's really uh, you. 
Uh, well, that, for, that book has a comic strip I, I did about Lucy and De, uh, Lucy. Right. No, Ricky and Fred joining Nambla. People seem to remember that. <laughs> right, one. right. You know? But uh, for people who are familiar with your work, they are familiar with your work. Yeah, well, you've, you've probably seen it in the, in, in the Howard, Howard Stern books or, or the New yeah. Yorker cover or yeah. Mad Magazine or something. But yeah. Howard wanted me to draw Milton Berle's cock but in the chapter, but winding around each page from the <laughs> five pages, <laughs> up and down, around, and then ending in the... In the and so like, Simon and sort of like no, Sergio Aragonese's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Simon choose to put the kibosh on that. So oh, that's too bad. That was the end of that. But I still might want to do a comic strip about his schlong, but not actually show it. If there's a way to do it without actually, because I don't think I can sit there and draw it and have to like stare at that for. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys uh, find Milton Berle funny ever at all? I, as a historian, am not allowed to say whether I find him funny or not, but I don't find him I'm funny. No. I, I'm, no. But I feel like he's a guy who could memorize jokes like yeah. Bob Hope and rattle them off. But is Milton Berle, was Milton Berle no, funny? You know, no, he's, well, I, I can only say this. He's never made me laugh. And I'll tell you somebody who I find excruciatingly not funny is Charlie fucking Chaplin. Mm. I, you couldn't make me laugh at Charlie Chaplin if you put a gun in my mouth, well, I just he definitely, don't find him he definitely funny. wrote the driest autobiography of all time. <laughs> yeah, there is no comedy yeah. whatsoever in there. Yeah. It's just about living in a bleak uh, chimney town in, yeah. in uh, Poverty Row in, uh, in mm. England. And, but he was more of an actor, and that's not guy. uncommon yeah. that actors who do comedies are themselves not funny, yeah. but they can act. But all that schmaltzy, I just find it. I know how he's... But, but my, there are people of that era. I, I, I really laugh at Harold Lloyd. I really laugh at the Marx Brothers. Buster but, Keaton. But here's, a weird, Keaton. here's another the, weird... I laugh at the Three Stooges. Here's another weird thing about Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton. When we watch the great footage of them and the great clips of them, they're not clips that make us laugh. They're clips that make us go, wow, what a stunt. He's yep. dangling from a phone. Yep. Or the he train almost hit him. Or the house has collapsed. Yeah. But right. it's not actually... A good joke point. or a good comedy. Point. It's like an action star. Brilliant. Yeah, Don't get yeah. me wrong. But, but he's a brilliant, yeah, brilliant, brilliant physical comedian and, and really, uh, uh, there's a, and, and that's really something that is in, uh, uh, a, a, pre- a precious ability that you don't see often. Um, there's a really brilliant, uh, comic actor here in LA. I really think you, especially with Love Me, uh, Ithamar Enriquez. Uh, he has a one-man show called Ithmar Has Nothing to Say. It's uh, uh, silent. It's an hour. Mm. And it's phenomenal. Wow. Yeah. He I will see performs it. at Second City a I'm lot. a big fan of uh, Josh Fadum, young Josh sure, Fadum. Sure, of course. Yeah, who yeah. is maybe the only guy who does physical comedy in the stand-up world. Right. You know? Just brilliant physical shtick can make you laugh in hysterics just yeah. doing pratfalls for five straight minutes. Yeah. Uh. And uh, much like Buster Keaton, much, much like Jerry Lewis, Josh has told me that he has gotten seriously injured. Of course, doing yeah. Wow. I mean, he flails all he's over dedicated. the place, yeah. jumps off the stage like he's crowd diving except onto a, a bare floor. Right, but it's yeah. just so wow. uh, adept and brilliant and hilarious. Yeah, you'd really, you'd also like uh, Itamar Enriquez. Now, um, just back to Milton Berle for a second. Um, I think because he was the first guy on yeah. TV. You don't have to drag me back to talking about Milton. Well, Burrell. I can always go back. I'm not going where you think. But just to, like he was the he was the first. He was like the pioneer on television as far as comedians go. So there was no competition for him at the beginning. Right. And, well, you know, Sid Caesar soon, uh, soon after. Later. But at first it was just him, and he was like you now, know Sid so in your face. Laugh. Yeah, Sid Caesar well, makes a lot me of laugh. that stuff holds up, and some of it just doesn't. Like you know, yeah. Milton Berle. I'm trying. To, I'm racking my brain trying to point out something funny, but there is one funny thing I can uh, point out about Milton Berle: his radio show, mm. where you don't actually see him, and uh-huh. it was scripted by Nat Hiking yes. in the late right. '40s. That is excellent. It's hilarious. Yes, it's, it's beautifully scripted. Arnold Stang is in it. Yeah, it's if you I can send you tapes, but yeah. it's great. It's better than his TV show ever was. Yeah, and it's often surreal and abstract, which yeah. I'm assuming is a hikingism. I think I, maybe we talked about this once we before. Did. There's one joke I can remember from the Milton Berle radio show that made me laugh. It was just totally absurd. Uh, where they go to a party and uh, there's a woman who's on a date with somebody, but it's obviously a man <laughs> voicing the woman. <laughs> and uh, Milton Berle says to the woman, are you having a good time? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like an hors d'oeuvre? Oh, yes. And then throughout the episode, whenever this woman talks, all you hear is, oh, yes, like over and over and over. He and did that great. show in 47 by 48. He was on TV and it was all downhill from there, although it became yeah. Mr. Television and all that. Yeah. Well, the text- Mr. Tuesday he, Night. Yeah. He's very good in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Yeah, he's fine. I yeah. liked him in the 60s because his hair became blue. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Look at him in the Oscar. His hair is like gray blue. I don't know how he pulled that off. But, you know, like, <laughs> had that. Also, he had like gray, like gray side, uh, you know, uh, temp, uh, 
What do you call uh, those? Temples. Temples, temples. yeah. The Reed, I, he had the I don't Reed, know what kind of look he was. He had Reed Richards Yeah, temples. yeah, exactly. Well, Not, there's a, there's, or Jim Jensen was a, a broadcaster in New York that New Yorkers would know. You just made me laugh thinking about a great bit. And um, I believe on one of the for, – for those of you who are uh, comedy fans uh, – uh, Part of your your comedy education is not complete if you don't own Robert Klein's Child of the 50s. And I'm pretty sure this is on Child of the 50s and or Mind Over Matter. They are both brilliant. And among the more dense comedy albums you'll ever buy, there's like three albums worth of material on each album. And the FM late night, New York late night FM radio DJ bit. And the joke that you reminded me of was just a woman on, Lo- a woman on Long Island called wants to hear more Arnold Stang. We're going to try to get that out to you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's a very wow. hip now, Arnold joke. Arnold Stang is somebody. Arnold Stang. And Arnold Stang is somebody who is truly hilarious. The poor man's Wally Cox. And incapable of not being funny, just like Don on knots, standing yeah. still, doing nothing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Hilarious. Born funny. Every fiber, every yep. fabric of them, uh, yep. funny. No matter what they were doing, they would make you and laugh. Not, not necessarily a comedian, but a comedic actor, I suppose. Yeah. But also a, could be a dramatic actor. Was like he on him. Steve Allen? Arnold Stang? Yeah. And not to my knowledge, he but I'm sure a, he, he was a Burl, He was a Burl regular. Burl regular? His, throughout was, the he, early 50s. He was, also, he was a regular on a number of programs. He would appear on the Fred Allen show, the Allen Young show. He was a sidekick on the Milton Burl show. And he was a sidekick on uh, one other program that I'm blanking on, early 50s uh, radio. But yeah, he was ubiquitous. Cartoon yeah. voices. All, all that, like the early cartoons like Herman and Catnip, and yeah. then later Top Cat, of course. Right, yes. And that's right. GTC. He died recently. I really wanted to include him in my one of my old Jewish comedian books. Yes, he. I could not get good reference of him as an older man. How and that, that's I, another. Let's, let's. I didn't want to annoy. I didn't want to contact him personally. I tried not to do that. So well, well, I had to leave him out. What's amazing about that, just to, is that uh, you know what you, your book and 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 your books, in addition to Heroes of the Comic Books, you have another series of books called uh, Old Jewish Comedians, right. which is these amazing portraits of these old classical comedians, some of them famous, some of them not, um, and and their stories. And it's just sort of like because everything that everything that's in show business now has already been done in a different form, mm. and and I find that fascinating. I mean, Jim Carrey at his peak in the nineties was making Jerry Lewis movies from the 50s. You know, and and that's not a knock. Uh, that's that's how it works. And uh, I find it really fascinating to 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 keep that awareness of like, well, this is the origin of that and this is where that came from. And, yes. Uh, you know and, what's weird is that like people defame Henny Youngman. If they're going to insult somebody, they'll be like, well, he's like a Henny Youngman style, meaning that he's corny. But Henny Youngman did these brilliant, short, brevity jokes. Yeah. Mitch Hedberg is considered a hipster comedian and the hippest comedian. Yeah. He is doing Henny Youngman style jokes. Right. So was Rodney Dangerfield in between the two. But it's yeah. funny how people from a previous generation will be maligned almost just because they're from a different generation. Sure. And somebody from a new generation will be embraced as hip and cool, even if they're doing the same thing as the absolutely. old school person. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and and um, Stephen Wright, Stephen Wright would say, like, I'm doing Jackie Vernon. Right. Uh, people don't see it, but I'm really influenced yeah. by Jackie Vernon. Yeah, Jackie Vernon was hilarious. It. Jackie yeah. Vernon's career was uh, spearheaded by Steve Allen. Steve Allen saw Jackie Vernon performing in Vancouver at the Cave Nightclub and booked him. Jackie Vernon had been doing Rickles' act in the 50s to no success. He was an yeah. angry, hostile, aggressive, mm. loud, insult comedian. Didn't work. So he rewrote his act to sort of apply to his demeanor, his look of this right. dour, downbeat guy and his opening joke, which he used for years, which is what got Steve Allen uh, to book him on the Steve Allen show was, you wouldn't know it by looking at me, but I used to be a very dull guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that joke was That's like great. kind yeah. of... What he looked like people, a passive people know him now only from the voice of Frosty the Snowman, I think. Yeah. And his last, right, last thing he ever did was a sure. slasher movie. A lot of comedians, for some reason, like Joey Ross, Henny Youngman, Appeared in like vile slasher gore movies in the Ver- 70s and 80s. Veronica oh, Lynch's last film, I yes, think, was a yes. slasher Blood film. Fe- half, of my, yeah, half, of my half of my filmography it's is like, in it, horror movies. Ja- Jackie Vernon's <laughs> last project is a movie called Microwave Massacre wow. from That's 1984. Fantastic. God so bless de- him. So desperate to work, or they loved the script and they had to do it. <laughs> what was it? Well, Henny Youngman would never turn down a job. That's why he's in Herschel Gordon Lewis's yeah. The Gore Gore Girls. You could call Henny up. You know, he, well, the Gore Gore Girls. You could call him up and he would come to a bar mitzvah as long 
long as you met his yeah, price, which right. I think was a thousand dollars. He would show much. up anyway. Yeah. A thousand, I think, po- possibly lower. Well, uh, Henny Youngman was inspired by Sophie Tucker. Sophie Tucker, at the end of every one of her shows, she was the founder of merch. Now all comedians sell merch at the yeah. end of their shows. But Sophie Tucker used to so sell fun. jams and jellies, mm, and that's really? how she made most of her money, cash in hand, tax free. You know what? That's what I'm going to do. Instead of normally after my shows, I sell posters. Now. Jams it's, and jellies. It's all my canning. Oh, canning. <laughs> well, it, Sophie Tucker, when she died, they found hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash in her home. And it was all from that uh, merch that she sold. Is that, Henny Youngman used to sell jewelry after his shows because his brother was a jeweler. Jewelry? Yes, yes. If, uh, uh, if I went on eBay and, and typed in Sophie Tucker uh, jam or jelly, are there like bottles of, with her face? Well, there's on? also I Sophie mean, Tucker sex jelly. So you really have oh, to be very yeah. specific. Well, that's what I want. That's <laughs> Sophie what, Tucker joy jelly. Wow. Yeah, the last of the red hot jelly. Speaking Speaking of which, there's a, you know, uh, uh, going through your book, I flagged some stories that I found super interesting. Elizabeth Marston really struck out. One of the uh, creator of Wonder Woman, well, by she and large? Basically created, not necessarily her husband actually created Wonder Woman, William uh, Marston. Right. And he's in the first book. Um, he also invented the polygraph test. But... Um, the only reason she's in the book for one, there's just one simple reason is that when he was uh, given the assignment to create a superhero by Bill Gaines, father, Max Gaines, who ran uh, this comic company and hired William Marston, he said to his wife, I'm, uh, I've been hired to write a superhero. And she said, make it a woman. Right. And that's, that's all, that was her one contribution to, to comic books. But I thought worthy enough to, for her to be included in this book. Well, here's what struck me. Uh, Marston based the character on both his wife, Elizabeth, and the younger Olivia Byrne, who lived with the couple in an open marriage. That's true, yeah. And yeah, she was a sexy young woman that they had kind of adopted, and it was a a, a, a menage a trois, basically, in the marriage. And, and what year is this? Is in the forties, fo- early forties, late thirties, early forties. They lived together as you know, the three of them were you know uh, together. So you know, an open marriage, I guess, is what you'd call it. Wow. And I wanted to include her, but I couldn't find any reference. Actually, I did find some reference, but not strong enough to base anything on. Right. She was very attractive and had a Wonder Woman look, you know, with the black hair and whatnot. Yeah. And it's funny how Wonder Woman is sort of coming back now. She's in the, she was in the new uh, Batman Superman movie, and I guess they're doing a Justice League right. movie or something. When like I, back when I was naive, I drew Hillary Clinton as Wonder Woman. What was I thinking? Because <laughs> that was on the cover of the New York Observer. But it's, you know. it's very unusual to me that there was no Wonder Woman like film or TV show until the 70s, because the character yeah. was created in the early 40s. It's possible she was too bosomy, and they didn't know what to do with well, that. The, and this is something that I'd forgotten about that, I again, I got in your book, that Wonder Woman went under a big redesign mm-hmm. in the 70s, and the character changed. And she, she gave up her powers... She became a feminist. She became a feminist. She wore a pantsuit. Mini skirt, too. Yeah, mini or a pantsuit yeah. and go-go boots and ran a fashion design firm. That's true. They ran a, f- a few issues of that, and then they reverted back to the old one. I think they thought that the old suit was too campy for the early 70s, so they had to yeah. update, you know. It's sort of like there was an episode where Lois Lane becomes black, and all of a sudden she has a big afro. You remember that? That was a one shot, a one shot. An issue of the comic? Yeah, an issue. That she's on the cover, like like walking into a closet and coming out black with a big fro. Oh my god, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> we need to adapt that for that a was the, that was the uh, that was the first episode of Super White Motherfucker. <laughs> This is this giant fat business, not unlike the dot com industry. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, and then and then the balloon pop. What Correct. did the did the balloon pop or was there a slow leak? It was a slow leak because it took a generation of children. This is my theory. It has no basis. In fact, I can't back it up. Because but it's important but, to say as a signpost. Now, the era that you and I are talking about, the Roseanne, the Tim Allen era, mm-hmm. the Seinfeld era, it's over. Yes. You can't do that anymore. No. Um, no. And there are networks that still try it. They do. All broadcast networks still try it. Right. But but the much more salient and useful version is Louie or Atlanta. Uh, shows like that where you find an inspired creator, uh-huh. you write them a check, and you tell them to go make the show. Right. Which is roughly what we did with you. Yes. So, and, and I think that's the new version of, okay, we're going to get Bruce Helford and we're going to put right. this stand up in it and right. it's going to be 13 on the air at ABC. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, those days are gone. Mickey! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Also with an exclamation point. Helping out dad. <laughs> I remember... No, just, it's the precocious nine-year-old who helps raise dad. Here's a weird... Because dad's yeah. really a kid. Well, here's a, here's a weird... Okay, here's a weird story just from living in LA, and then I want to get back to this because it's, it's important. I was in the Kinko's, <laughs> now the FedEx office, but formerly Kinko's, on Sunset Boulevard by the All-American Burger. A comedian friend of mine, Drew Carey, came in with a script, and Julie Wixon was with him. Sure. Now Julie Darmody. Now Julie Darmody. And I said to hey, Manager Drew. Manager to the stars. Yeah. Hey, Drew, what are you doing? I just uh, wrote a pilot. What's it called? The Drew Carey Show. <laughs> we're, making, we're making the first copies. I said, oh, good luck. Yep. That was it. I was there when they made the copies in a little town <laughs> called Vaudeville, USA. <laughs> Uh, but you you have an interesting theory about one of the things that changed. Tell in addition to Steve Jobs and the digital revolution, sure, sure. Which, which cut through. But that's part and parcel of this, if you think about it. Did it which what I'm cut saying. through that business model like a like a fucking pendulum? Yeah, my theory is that, and the reason it was air coming out of a balloon versus a pop was because it took the a certain generation to become of age for them to really enact the change that they did on the business. Right. And my theory is that I can blame all the pitfalls and the general decline of the business on the in-car DVD player for the following reason. That entire generation that was raised with that in the car, when they screamed and yelled and bitched and moaned, the parent put on the DVD and the kid shut up. And what the kid learned was, I'll now substitute business school talk, what the kid learned was the consumer has choice and convenience. And once you give the consumer choice and convenience, they never give it back. So that kid thought, I can have all the content I want, when I want it, how I want it, where I want it, a.k.a. on demand. The right. in-car DVD player was the first on-demand system. And that entire generation that got raised on it in the 90s, so the heyday of what you and I were just describing with right. the stand-ups, 95, 96. Right. Right. That's, that, that's the sweet spot. Right. That generation that grew up in the 90s with the DVD players in the car came of age in the 2000 aughts mm -hmm. and has continued to basically reject the – it's on Thursday at 8.30. Yeah. That's the only time you can see it. No, it's not. No, it's not. My parents put it on whenever I want it. And right. then they grew up and they figured – I want it when I want it. Yeah, well, people are largely unaware of when a show. There are exceptions which are amazing. Uh, the Walking Dead is like a Sunday night. People on Sunday night watch the goddamn Walking Dead. Yeah, um, but it's still the ratings grow. Live three, live seven, they grow. Yes, yes, they do go up. Most, almost all. Certainly, I'll just only speak in our little universe of AMC networks. But almost everything is time shifted viewing now. There's very little that you find. You know, our childhood right. of eight o'clock Thursday. Right. My it's, show is on. Is gone. Right. Is gone. Yeah. Right. And look at the way your daughters consume media. Yeah. They don't. They they don't. You know, Jordan Levin's son. It's all on their phone. Yeah. And and they don't like the the obnoxious term for it is I'm screen agnostic. Uh -huh. Which means I don't care if I watch it. That's also because of the DVD player, by the way. The image quality in those min in those Chrysler minivans was right. shit. Yeah. The screens were shit. The DVD player was shit. It skipped when you went over a bump. It was right. crap. The kids didn't care. Yeah. And what that taught them was, who gives a shit about Stanley Kubrick? I don't. Well, I don't. I, I don't care by about way, cinematography. I, never, I don't. I, I mean, I care about cinematography, but I, I do. I, I don't care about pixels. I don't care. You know, I actually. I like, as you can tell by Stand Against Evil. Yeah, no, I get it. I like well, a you, down... you you picked a specific look and tone yeah. and era and then replicated it. But I I like that era. I no, like well, I like I analog. You it I, yeah, you liked it. yeah, I like analog. I like. I don't. Yeah, Stan Station Wagon. Yeah, I don't like when you see the telenovela effect on television. Right. You know, I, I yeah. the first thing you do when I get a television. Where it's so hyper real, it looks like video. It looks like a telenovela. And the first yeah. thing I do when I get a television is how do I turn this off so yeah. I hate watching Casablanca and it looks like a black, it, it looks like it's shot on video. On video. It's awful. It looks like an episode of Golden Girls yeah, it's in black awful. and white. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah. Um, I, I, and, and I don't know, like, yeah, when you watch it, you're not going to get that on your phone. It doesn't matter. There's no, no it reason doesn't to, matter on your There's phone. no reason to download something in HD if you're watching it on your phone. But that's my point. Yeah. You and I take the trouble to make it in HD. Right. The audience doesn't seem to care. Yeah. They consume it where the, on their phone. My it daughters will sit in front of the television and it will be off and they will be watching stuff on their phone. Correct. Because uh, it doesn't matter to them. Yeah. Ant Farm, which apparently is a <laughs> very popular show with the children. Very popular. Yeah. No, but it's really – the uh, the Giving the consumer choice and convenience – 
along with a tremendous facility with technology, if you yes. look at your daughters, compared to you and I bumbling, fumbling, and stumbling right. to try and turn something on. Well, my kids are Chinese, too. Um, well, so that's cheating. They know the people that um, made it. Some of their cousins made it. They're bunk mates <laughs> at, the- <laughs> at Foxconn. Yeah. Um, but uh, the the quality of the image and that sort of thing is irrelevant to them because they grew up with it not mattering. It doesn't matter to them. So that is how the television industry has changed. And you at IFC, and I think in terms of this business model, it's very hard to underestimate the importance of Louis because Louis did not do what Seinfeld did. Correct. Uh, it was not developed in the network. Uh, FX didn't hook Louie up with a writer and they developed a show together and then they got a lot of notes and you know, Louie no. became a single father with a precocious kid living on the Upper West Side. No. How did that happen? Louie Louis struck a bargain very similar to the one you struck in the sense of, I will trade you, I will gladly pay you Tuesday, said right. maybe for his hamburger. I will gladly trade you financial wherewithal. Right. In other words, you're going to have a constrained budget like you just did when you made your show. Right. But the return for that is I want unfettered creative freedom. Right. And to their eternal credit, Nick Grad and Schreier and Landgraf and those guys said yes. Yeah. And the, and did, the and deal, the, and and the deal they struck deal. was give me the money. I'm going to go make the shows and I don't want to hear anything about it. Right. And they stuck to it. And that show is fabulous and begat, I think. Atlanta and other shows like that right. where it's so – and yours even – where it's so clear that the creator's voice is undistilled. Yes. Is, sorry, is distilled. It's, it's, it's pure. Just, yeah, it's Marin is – Marin it's un, is an It's example. undiluted. Yeah. Marin, Marin did it. Yeah. Like, yep. I look at the shows that – I mean mine's different because it's not based around my stand No, but when, remember we, when we originally conceived it, it was not based around your stand-up, but it's based on your dad and you were going to play the lead. Yes. Yes. And then you quite wisely said – what about an actor? <laughs> uh, you know, so, no, that wasn't even it, dude. It's really with 425 scripted series on the air and Netflix spending $5 billion on content this year versus NBC, which is spending 4.5. Think about that for a second. Wow. Uh, billion? There's no way – billion with a B. There's no way to break through – Netflix is making 77 series this year. Um, there's no way to really break through – Unless you have something to help you in the marketing. And our marketing budget is limited, much as right. much of cable is. And we need names in our shows. Oh, uh, by the way. And whether it's Marin or whether it's Fred and Bill Hader or yeah. whether it's having Seth Meyers EP on something. Yeah. And, and it, we need something to market. Oh, I, I don't in argue. In the case yeah. of this show, don't forget, this was a, a pretty serious roll of the dice for the for upper management because comedy horror is so hard to do. You killed it in getting the tone right. But that's a roll of the dice in and of itself. Right. And so right. this genre is not what IFC traditionally does. IFC no. is a comedy network, pure and simple. And uh, at least on the programming side. And after after you get past that, that you're doing horror or comedy, horror comedy, right. uh, there's the roll of the dice of are you going to nail it? And all of those factors weigh into, as I told you earlier, fear-driven decision-making, which yeah. is prevalent in our business. People start saying, how do we get anyone to watch this? It's not really what we do. I know what we do. Yeah. Simplistically, we put a name in it. Well, yeah, I I, I go back to my... Uh, and McGinley's got nine years of scrubs and a ridiculous yeah. following, as we've learned now. And he's, and he's brilliant. And he's he, brilliant in yeah. it, and he, he killed the part, yeah, and he swears sort of like your old man. No, and- he was, he, no he, <laughs> it was... I, I, I'll just look at it, you know, creatively... Had I done it in makeup, one, it's makeup. You can always tell it's makeup. Two, I'm not the actor John McGinley is. Um, uh, th- three, um, it was the first time, having worked at The Simpsons so much, you know, those actors own those characters, but it's animated. So you really have a lot of control over what, how Homer's going to be in that episode. Right. Um, this is the first time as a as a writer I had to create a character and then give it to John. And it's not fair to say it was same with Janet, but I wrote it for Janet. Right. Like I knew what I was gonna get with Janet. With John, I didn't know him really that well. And I I trusted his ability, but I didn't know what he was gonna do with it. And and he came back with not what I had in my head, a flavor of it, but different in a way that was much better for the show. Right. He's he's younger. 
uh, and he's emotionally younger, and he's a lot more dynamic. Uh, he's a lot more physical. It's basically Quint with a daughter. Yes, which is great. Uh, and it was it was great to watch. You know, it, it was it was that's great interesting to see. though the way you say it because yeah. you wrote it as Carol O'Connor. Yeah, you wrote it as Archie. I wrote, yeah, I wrote it as it, my dad actually. Yeah. Tur- yeah, who's eighty five? You know, but yeah. but it turned into Quint. Yeah, it turned into Quint, and and like a Sterling Hayden kind of guy, and but as a result, <laughs> he was a lot more uh, active. Mm-hmm. He was a lot more active, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it it made it much better. And yeah, and I think that well, again, like we were talking about like Black Mirror or Portlandia, what you get now with the fragmentation of the audience is like, oh, show for me, great, yes. Yes. You know, it used to be like Twilight Zone, Star Trek. There's a couple shows. What, now, what you don't get, and going back to Louie a little There's bit a 43 on this, share. You don't get a 43 share. You don't get 250 grand to write the pilot like you and I used to back in the golden days of writing pilots in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you get the creative freedom. Now, the pro- the, if you want to go back and do it that other way, you can, and that's called broadcast television. Right. If you want to go do that, and I don't recommend it, no, but if you do, fun. buckle up, because you're going to get noted on your shoes, Yeah. and they haven't even opened the script yet. It's they're going to start with your outfit, and, that's, and then they'll start with page one. I have a couple of notes on the title page. Right, and that's just fear town, right? Is it just like- Fully, because yeah. that model is literally shitting itself. Yeah. I don't know how CBS is going to be the last man standing, and that's only because they can't pick up the remote anymore. The, too yeah, old. And the, the and there's two things that the broad, that broadcast has going against it. Uh, one, it's the aging down. The, the young people don't watch the by and large go there. To yes, watch for television. The, two years ago, for the first time ever, the median age of all four broadcast networks was above fifty. Right. Two. The median. That means there's a bunch of ninety year olds. Right. 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 Also. Yeah. Exactly. And two, they have to deal with the FCC. Correct. That cable doesn't. Uh, I can say shit. Mm-hmm. They, you still can't say shit on CSI. Right. Even in CSI shit town, the new one. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt Swan uh, fascinated oh, me. He's a Superman artist, right? He's a Superman yeah, artist. There were a bunch of them. But in his late, in his, it was in his 90s. And he did a collaboration with Alan Moore. Yeah, well, you know, they bring these old timers out of retirement, these legendary guys, or at least legendary to comic book fans. And, and uh, he was one of them. And Alan Moore was a fan of his work. So, you know, to come out of retirement, his work was a little shaky at that point. I could uh-huh. be completely wrong because I don't know that much about superheroes. But is Kurt Swan not the guy who drew that famous image of Superman holding a dead superwoman uh, and their clothes are tattered. It was like a crisis of infinitive earths. I know, I know that image. I'm not that much of a comic nerd where I can like tell you, I can pinpoint. So I remember the one of Batman holding Robin like that. That was yeah. evocative. Like, oh, yeah, I, like yeah, looking yeah. up to that God. Like, why? How did this happen? Yeah. I think they repeated that, that, that type of image over and over. Yeah. You know? well, well, they start killing off superheroes when sales dip. Somebody always dies. Yeah. And then they return. Right. Maybe Kill them off, bring later. them back. It's yeah. like, you know, like wrestling, you know, yeah. Yeah, some, sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. Yeah. You know, they killed, so like, off, they so killed like, off the mole men and never brought them back. <laughs> no, I'm still waiting. Those, that was like, to me, that was the height of Superman. Yes. You know? But like you had mentioned earlier, like, you know, like Jim Carrey, who was like doing Jerry Lewis. I'm interested right. in the early years because at, at some point they started repeating plots. The artwork became like, they re- rehash artwork, the later artists. Like, the, but you know, this, uh, I'm centering the guys who created the, that whole world of, right. you know, that those universes, like guys like Jack Kirby. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll take it to a, to a to a larger step uh you know and and cu- culture also it it all cycles around i mean we we are now entering a a an era of political conservatism whether it lasts for a couple of years or or more than we wish uh but culturally things are uh incredibly progressive and and expanding and and people tend to forget that at the height of the 60s the country elected Richard Nixon right. as the president. Yeah, mm-hmm. the two opposites are always happening concurrently. Even the yeah. stuff we're talking about in the 50s with Lenny Bruce, Mort Saul, Jules right. Pfeiffer, so progressive during McCarthyism. Yeah. The Beat Generation was, you know, laying the groundwork for the hippie generation, which right. were very uh, progressive or at least uh, subversive. Yeah. And that was all happening during mm-hmm. a very right wing time in mm-hmm. politics right. in America. I and was it like, was the, um, uh, since, since, since Donald Trump was elected president, 
I've been waiting. I've been trying to figure what? out what the silver lining is. Like, so la- uh, last night, two nights ago, I talked to my friend Kaz, who's a cartoonist who works for Disney. I said, what is the silver line? What do you think? He said, it's going to bring back the underground press. That is what's going to happen. Like, you know, the underground press I in the was, 60s. I was with you. And we those guys were my heroes, like Robert Crumb. Yeah, right. right. You, you were part of the conversation. Oh, yeah. So I said, like, uh, that cheered me up. Like, that stuff is going to come back. And, you know, I can, like, you know, do subversive work again. And, you know. Yeah, it will. It will. It doesn't. You know, it it doesn't, and I know people uh, people are 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 freaking out, um, but it doesn't change who you are, and uh, and people need to just settle down. Uh, good point. And you know, as as Gandhi said, just be the change you want. Right. But it doesn't. That, that's that not, doesn't. I don't stop. know that that's necessarily true. I think it, it, for me, it it certainly has changed me. It has made me more uh, politically active. No, in a good way. But what I'm saying is, it doesn't. You're not going to be. You're not. Gonna, there's no law that's going to prevent you from being creative. No, there's no law not. that's going to prevent you not. from caring about the, the downtrodden. There's of course no, you not. Know, but you know, I, I was I was thinking that's about, what people are afraid. That's it, where I see people in the wake of the election. The next day, I was marching in a protest for the first time I in remember, ten yeah, years. Right. I saw that on Facebook in, Man, in Manhattan, right. and I was five subway stops away watching it on tv and i was like right. why am i not there and right. you know i turned off the tv and it was it, great to see on tv it was invigorating yeah it was yes. like some, something was happening there but yeah. yeah and it was a great unifying inspiring uh, yeah, moment to know course, that we're not alone in that uh capacity. yes and i think it will continue and i think it will metastasize and i and you know the people on the people on the right look at those as a you know the 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 immediate reaction on the right was they're all uh, terrorists on George Soros's payroll. Right. And then it became the millennials who've never heard no and they're whining. Mm. And it's neither what it is, I think in my opinion is people vote for who they want to see in the mirror in a, in a large degree. Uh that is why right-wing conservatives will tell you that their economic policies benefit poor inner city African Americans more, uh, and they can make that argument and, uh, uh, it probably has some val- validity, but that African Americans don't vote for them because they don't identify with them culturally. And progressives argue that white working class guys in Ohio that are, you know, or that are, that our programs would benefit them more, but they don't vote for us because they don't identify with us culturally. That's the entire, what's the matter with Kansas? That people vote against their own economic interests because identity politics trumps that, no pun intended. Yeah. And I feel that what these protests are is a, is a large scale rejection of people wanting to say like, no, I am not satisfied with an, with a, with, the more uh demagogue the more demagogic demagogic aspects of of our president's uh uh public face well very so they and they reject that and that's great i'm all for that well very seldom does change occur because of who you vote for change occurs because of the social pressure you put on the people that have been voted in and that social pressure comes from barack obama was against Marriage equality. Yes. So until, is Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Right. Until enough people exactly. decided <laughs> that they were for it. And then what do you know? Public opinion is very powerful, even though it gets uh, run over most times. You know, yeah. in 2003, the majority of the world was opposed to the invasion of Iraq. And there was yeah. an international day of action. That was the last time I marched in a protest. I think it was January 20th, 2003, two months before the invasion. Right. Half a million people in London, England voted in protest of the war because Tony Blair was intending to right. help with the invasion. And he didn't listen to a half a million people. He completely right. ignored them. So still, that does happen. But yeah. if you keep that pressure up, if there's a half a million people in the streets every week, every month, yeah. every year, then they will listen to you. They'll tear gas you too. But yeah, um, yeah. But that's eventually, okay. that's how change happens. And if yeah. you look through history, and I'm fortunate to be a historian and have written a book about comedy – also gives me a perspective on the history of America. And you see that women's suffrage, civil rights movement again and again and again, none of of these new advances have come from voting. They've all come from the pressure you put on the people who've been voted in. And you're, and people have to remember, they're not powerless. You know, if you were opposed to a registry for Muslim Americans, then the day it starts register as a Muslim American 
flood the registry and make it useless. You're not powerless. Yeah. Um, but or but make I a just, donation to Planned Parenthood in Mike Pence's name. In Mike Pence's name, which I have. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, so, so have I. Yeah, but so nothing. I'm not going to change. I'm still going to post about Shemp Howard and Sid Melton. You have, yeah, that, you, you have, have, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. It's about balance. It's about balance. It's about balance. It's not going to change. Yeah. Well, no, if, people, if you don't, if you don't, the world goes on, and my world goes on, and yeah. You know, well, if you I'm don't do that, if you don't do that, you'll go insane. And what yeah. good is any of us as an insane person as an active force? You have to yeah. have groundness and sanity in order to be effective as a uh, yeah. dissenter. You know? Yeah. You have to admire NBC, which is trying to reinvent itself with these doing the only thing that they can do, like a live live, live musical. It's the only way to get a li- get an audience same yeah. day. And live and, live. And that's why, despite all of the advances in digital technology, and you can watch a phone on your watch, you can watch mm. a TV show on your watch, or what have you, people still go to the movies. Yeah, because it's there's a shared communal experience. Shared communal experience, uh, it, and, and yeah, and the and that doesn't go away. Same with baseball games, comedy. Yeah, going to stand up comedy. It's a it's a shared uh, communal feeling. And you know, they used to think that radio would kill the movies, that television would kill the yes, movies, but you exactly. can't. Every you, new platform is going to kill it because you go and you sit with other people, and you you share an event. And Have you noticed a difference in your 26 some odd years of doing stand up? Oh, it's more than that actually because you did it a lot before I I started when I, I was 17. Yeah. So in in all that time, do you is there any perceptible noti- difference in the audience and the reactions that you get because people don't engage in those activities as much? It used to be a fairly standard thing. You would um, go out with a large group of people, you'd go to the movies, you'd go see comedy, you'd whatever. It's now people leave much lead, at least as far as I can tell, much, much more so, sedentary yeah, well, sit on the couch the, and Netflix and chill lives. Well, three things are different, but what what's really um interesting is how little it has changed. Um I don't see That's as, heartening to me. Yeah, actually. you don't see as many giant groups of people. Mm-hmm. Um you don't see at least in the places where I work. So many crazily drunk people getting carried out. I mean, right. Boston in the eighties when I was starting out, <laughs> you know, it was just boot camp. I mean, people I had drunks literally wander up on what was stage. That Chinese place, the the ding ho. The ding ho. And Oof. and uh and you know, you go to Western Massachusetts for a one nighter and drunk people would literally come up on stage <sighs> and grab your clothes. I mean, I'm not lying. <laughs> These are all things that have happened to me. These are all things that have happened to me. Um uh Podcasting has really radically changed uh, the stand-up audience. You really, because of I know in my case, you have your audience, and you reach them with podcasts. Right. I think in terms of my specific career and my specific draw, having a podcast does a lot more for my notoriety and my public appearances than doing. The Tonight Show or anything like that, right? One because I've never done the Tonight Show. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't couldn't do it with Johnny. Couldn't do it with Jay. Can't seem to do it with Jimmy. <laughs> um, and because of a podcast, people feel like they know you. So now there's also a meet and greet after the show, right? Like at a wedding, where you go out and you say hi to people. And it's a, and it used to be you thing. would come off stage, go into the bar. And someone would come up to you and be like, "Hey, I really dug your set," yeah, but that yeah. was it. Yeah, or if it, it, when I didn't, I didn't drink when I was That's younger, right. so I was like, "How quickly can I get back to the hotel? <laughs> like, how, how, what is the shortest amount of time I can get from good night to my hotel?" To Rick room? Messina giving me money yeah. to back to yeah. my yeah. hotel. How can, I, how can I get? How can I get back quicker? Yeah, but it's it's great. I love meeting uh, people. Uh, I sell posters now. What I do mm-hmm. is I don't like I'm not a big merch dude, but I usually if I go on the road I'll make a poster for the gig. I have a friend of mine who's a graphic mm-hmm. artist to a poster, and I print up a hundred of them and I sell. I sign it for ten bucks. I break even, and uh, you get people have a souvenir and you right. you meet people and you say hi and it's great. Um, uh, it, it's nice. Cause I don't you know this reaches by this podcast reaches anywhere from sixty to eighty thousand people a month. Um, I have no sense of that. <laughs> you know, people, Do people come say it me, when they come up to you and get a poster sign. They all the say, time. I listen to your podcast. 90% of the time. Hmm. I love the podcast. I love the podcast. 90% of the people. Right. And they'll say something that like they remembered like from a month ago that I said, like, Oh, it's so weird. I just, 
I, I, how do you know that? I just said it in my kitchen. <laughs> You know, so it's, it's, it's very strange. And, you know, that's, it's another example. You know, what I like about it, when I left the Simpsons, um, and went back into performing and we had kids and I was working at the Simpsons and I was working every day, you know, 10 to nine Mm -hmm. and you never see your children. My wife was running a network, you know, so we had this like, well, one of us has to be here. Right. You know, we have kids. And then I was like, well, let's, one of us has to quit their job and be with the kids. Let's compare how much I make to, okay, I'll quit. (laughs) Wow, that is a big number. I quit. Jesus uh, Christ. So I quit. And I thought, I'll just, um, I will write movies. And I will do stand up for fun and I will be around for the kids. I found that writing movies, it just takes three years to get notes back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just like, it was, I, I, it's what I hate about the movie business. There's yeah, no time just, imperative. Yeah. There's so no time, people say to you, like, you know, no, this is really good. And, you know, s- summer of 2019, yeah, exactly. Ryan Gosling has an opening. This could be that movie. Yeah. It's just a, slow, so when I get back from Con, we'll talk about it. And you're like, yeah. Con's in six months. I know. Yeah. It, and it, we'll have a really good talk about it. Yeah. And I wrote a couple of movies like that. It was just I had like, a brief and wildly unsuccessful tenure in the feature business. That's when I got found out I got fired from the reporter. My only claim to fame in the feature business, because as I said, I was wildly unsuccessful, but I bought the spec script to the movie Three Kings. Oh, okay. John Ridley was the writer. He right. had 12 Years a Slave right. fame. But at the time, he was of Fresh Prince in Bel Air fame. And, he was, and a stand-up. And a stand-up comedy, comedian. Um, and I had met him on the John Larroquette show, where he was a story editor. And he had written this feature, and he wanted me to see it. And his version was... It was still Treasure of the Sierra Madre, but it was much more from the Ice Cube character. Of oh, okay, of, okay. Fuck the white yeah, man. Yeah, it is I'm Treasure the, the Money. And it is Treasure of the Sierra oh, Madre. Oh, it absolutely yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. It absolutely is. I bought the script. I was fired within that year, certainly. And David O. Russell came in. And five years after that, right. the movie came out. And George Clooney <laughs> did not promote it because he hated David O. Russell Correct. so much. They I apparently believe, were at each other's throats I on set. believe he threatened him physically or they did have a fist fight Here, here's a story that might be apocryphal but it came from someone who was a producer on the movie because as you, it was a wit thomas movie. right george is a prankster apparently uh-huh. david russell not so much <laughs> uh george so much. george much like leslie nielsen's fart machine george likes a water pistol hidden in his hand squirting onto your crotch to make it look <laughs> like you went pp george finds this to be the height of comedy David O. Russell did not, and apparently uh, wackiness ensued. Oh, boy. See, I'm going to go with George on that one. I'm with George. <laughs> I'm with George. You know. Uh, you got to make it fun on set. Political class, whenever it tries to squelch the cultural class, uh, whenever it gets its fingers in that pot, there's always, and it's one of my favorite things, the law of unintended consequences, which happens 100% of the time. And uh, to me, a shining example of that is the comics code. Mm. Go, uh, go a little bit into what it was and how that affected uh, the comics industry at the time and, and how, how it really backfired on, uh, on what the uh, intended consequence was. Well, when... EC Comics was at its height in the early 50s, and they were th- their best-selling titles were horror comics like Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, et cetera, and all the and other- these are really gross, graphic- Yeah. yeah. Not and- actually graphic, but um, not as graphic as things would get later, but the imitators of EC Comics became more graphic. Right. A EC lot of stands for educational, too. Educa- that was well, really they became entertaining comics. They oh, started okay. educational. When Bill Gaines took it over, it became entertaining. And they were the best-selling comics in the industry. At, at the time, the horror genre was huge. Vault of Horror, Tales in the yeah. Crypt. And crime comics, too, like Crime Does Not Pay, right. which were like realistic stories about, you know, uh, criminal... I mean, actually, like... Uh, case studies about criminal cases, uh, really well done, beautifully drawn. But there were, so, but there were also these schlocky uh, crime and horror comics. It was just every publisher was there was a you know so many of them that finally like it started to rise up. Like, well, we got to do something about this. And then there were Senate committees equating crime comics, horror comics to juvenile delinquency. And this is in the fifties. Yeah, 
in the, right. in the early 50s, headed by um, uh, Senator Kefauver. Right. Yeah. As and, then, and then Do- uh, Dr. Frederick Wortham wrote That's why book. so many people, he was such a popular senator. Yeah. That is why so many people right. today well, are named. That became his cause. That's why so many know? people today are named Estes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he, that became his cause, you know, and, and, and he rose up, especially he was backed up by Dr. Frederick Wortham's book on uh, comic books. Seduction of the Innocent. So, yeah, like how comic books were seducing these children into like becoming uh, murderers, axe murderers, et cetera. You know, there's no right. case studies of that, but. Right. So. It's, it's the, and it, and that song gets sung with heavy metal, with video right. games, Every with movies. Yeah. yeah, with hip hop. Every yeah, generation. Yeah, so all yeah. the stuff like uh, like accumulated where they had to, like the, the comic publishers were like freaking out. Like, what are we going to do about this? Like, how are we going to save our necks? Uh, because they, you know, they, they, people were stopped distributing the comics. They stopped selling them. So they had to save the necks. So they instituted this comics code, which is a little box in the corner of the comic, assuring people that this comic is going to be clean and in good taste. And then, and so they, they, all the horror comedy uh, comics and the crime comics, they just went out of business. EC Comics went out of business, like we said before, with Bill Gaines only having Mad left. And all the other ones were wiped out. They were just cleaned out and everything became sanitized and safe and bland. And that's when I lose interest in comic books. It was know, sort of the like the uh, film code in yeah, movies because it was theory, self-imposed yeah. as right. a self-preservation in a way. We'll right. rate it ourselves so that the government doesn't. Right. That was the Will Hayes code. So yeah. right. you know, I, Hayes think, I don't think that ruined movies, but it just like there was no more sexual You know what's interesting window. though? There was no film company that abstained from that. They all imposed the R, the PG-13, the PG. But in comics, there was one major company that refused to put the uh, Comics Code Authority on it, and it was Dell Comics, who published Donald Duck and Little Lulu. They right. refused to put that seal of approval on it. They didn't even need it. And they, they didn't they, need they it. They survived because they, the, they protected they, Disney. They, they didn't need it, but they took offense to the idea that they would dare put anything out that wasn't right, acceptable. Right, 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 And so it was kind of weird, they, and they were right, but in a way, it was a political act. Like, how yeah. dare you tell us what to do? Right. We're just well, then, not putting it on there, and we'll still sell Donald other Duck. Other publishers like who had been doing those depraved Co- crime and horror comics they like you know okay we're in trouble here let's switch gears and then they created casper the friendly ghost or little audrey or, or you know like the the, the, the uh, family friendly comics that came out in the mid 50s too. like just switch gears like okay we're done with that so let's do this let's but do- but it doesn't last uh, well, like little by then, little, like you know, the, by like the, the 60s. horror comics come back, and the, and the horror, the specifically horror comics come back. Now, it does give birth to Mad Magazine, which got around it because it became a magazine, not a comic book, which yeah, is a, got which is a it, postal yeah. regulation. Basically, yeah. Yeah. But it which, got around it. It didn't need the code. It was, it was, and also they geared it more towards adults at the beginning when right. Harvey Kurtzman was still there. It became more geared towards children a little later and became the institution it became huge. Right. But by the 60s, when Marvel Comics, like the Silver Age is what they call it, right. took off with the Hulk and Spider Man and all that stuff. Spider Man. And then, like, you know, they just, like, were doing incredibly well. And Stan Lee, like, ran this empire, Marvel Comics. Little by little, they could bring back the horror comics, but in magazine form, like, uh, Creep and eerie published by james warren right so warren they kind of revived ec comics the same artists some not the same writers but the same artists came back in black and white so you know and 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 beautifully drawn by guys like frank Frazetta and uh, jack davis and right. etc but uh, um, and then like little by little by the late Bernie 60s later they started and- ignoring yeah a little later bernie wrightson came in the later 60s yeah. he was like one of the best guys yeah but by still the late, around yeah, yeah, still terrific. Yeah, but they they started pushing the boundaries by the late sixties, like adding like references to drugs, and so people weren't paying attention to the comics code by then. It kind of faded out. So mm-hmm. you know, by but the seventies, yeah. But it it there was no market decline in juvenile delinquency <laughs> during the comics. Code. Was like what happened was like uh, most <laughs> of those comic books got uh, boring. That's I don't the think I don't there was any decline in that, but all those guys lost their jobs. They had to look for new for new work. All those yeah. artists and writers and editors they were out of work. Stan Lee was down to him and his secretary by the mid fifties. That's when my dad was working up there at the same company as a magazine editor. And then the next office was Stan Lee, and my dad felt bad for him. Like, well, they're trying to phase him out, is what he would say at the time. Well, pre creation of the superhero craze from Marvel or Timely. It was all kind of romance comics, right? Always like the model phases, and- like originally, you know, the superheroes were the first big craze in comic books, like Superman, then Batman, yeah. Captain America, etc. Then like little, and then like that would peter out, and then romance and westerns, maybe romance and comics. Crime. There, there are so many people in the book that are writing and drawing romance comics. Romance comics are so bizarre to me <laughs> because comic books 
are such a boy thing. Right. And yet there are all of the true romance. You know, most of them a, written a and girl, drawn by ugly Jewish guys. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know. what was there was one that was a a girl, a moon romance. Yeah, that was an EC title before before the horror stuff came. That became a, a moon that a became girl romance. A moon yeah. a girl romance. Yeah, and that became weird tales. Well, like, like yeah, that they evolved into other titles. You know, yeah, it's it's complicated reasoning. Crazy that, bitches but, was one later. Basically. <laughs> but like uh, wildest west women I mean, be saddle, saddle westerns became haunt of fear comics. You know, for you know, like with the next issue. So. Someone who was addicted to saddle <laughs> westerns would have gotten their new issue. It's now Haunt of Fear. Like, what happened? I love saddle westerns. Like, how could they do this to me? Yeah, and there was all these real, like, the World War II, I remember, like, Sergeant Rock and all of yeah. those comics, which are really just, uh, like, uh, Ways to trick kids into joining. Those were me. really oh, like yeah, macho, all, <laughs> racist, jingoism. Kind Those of yeah. comics were really macho and like not a good representation of what actually happened during World War Two. No, World War not at but all. When Harvey <laughs> Kurtzman did war comics, they were like you know from the perspective of the enemy, from right. the Japanese in the trenches and whatnot. Kurtzman and they did were like, brilliant war. Yeah, comics. he did. They're beautiful. Most of those comics were like you know uh, like let's get in there and beat the enemy and, and kick a, and Japanese uh, kick, kick their ass and the Koreans and stuff. But Harvey Kurtzman came in with EC comics with his titles like Blazing Combat or um, uh, uh, I forget the titles but offhand but he had one raving choreographer was also a big (laughs) but they was like from the perspective of the of the enemy you know like you know who are human beings too so they were like you know well thought out and sensitive and sensitive to the enemy like what they were going through so that was new to comics and they still hold up beautifully yeah they're gorgeous they're gorgeous yeah um, well, you know, it's the, uh, the, uh, one of the police book. It is the, the holiday season. If you're a fan of my podcast and you have people in your life that are fans of this, I cannot recommend from Drew Friedman, Heroes of the Comics, volume one and two, and Old Jewish Comedians, which if you're a stand up comedy fan is required, uh, owning. And then the perfect, uh, companion piece, uh, is Cliff Nesterov's The Comedians. If you have a comedy fan in your life, that's all your Christmas shopping. Mm. That right there is a, a beautiful must have, uh, group for your bookshelf. And uh, I'm really glad you guys, uh, uh, came by today and, uh, we're out of here. Happy Thanks. holidays. Thanks, Dana. Merry Christmas. Let's, I'm going to join the war on Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy winter Halloween. Merry holidays. Spooky winter Halloween. It's uh, have a baby outside day. So it's a very DIY. It's a very kind of punk rock thing. It's like, we're going to give you money. You go make a show. We're not going to give you a lot of money, but we're giving you freedom mm-hmm. and you can make a show. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a very punk rock ethos. So like, we're not, we don't need the big record labels. We're, we're a band with the Ramones. Yes. We're, just give us a little bit of money. We're going to go make this album and do it. It's a different situation in the music business, but the music business has also been radically altered. Oh, I think the music business was the canary in the coal mine in the past 20 years. Yeah. If yeah. if you look at it, we went from an album centric universe yeah. to a singles right. centric universe. Similarly, in content in film media, we've gone from motion picture films to TV episodes to viral videos, right? That get sent around and right. have fifteen million hits, right? So it's it, now Apple hasn't figured out a way to sell you those videos for one buck each yet. Right. They're trying. They will. They're trying. Fear not. Yeah, but. Hulu's got a way to charge you. Netflix can charge you. Amazon can charge you. So that that the what happened to the music business is analogous to yeah. what came and after I have, in the entertainment and I have film. friends that are professional musicians that are kind of famous mm-hmm. and uh, they're on the road. Well, that's where the money is. Yeah, that. But it, you know, you can't do. You can't just be a studio musician anymore. And you know what, Dana? You can't just do shows for IFC anymore. Yeah. No. Because if, if, if you would had Stan at Fox 15 years ago, that was your gig. You were yeah. making 22 of them a year. Yeah. You were cranking them out. You got your back nine picked up in right. January and you yeah. wanted to hang yourself. And you get four months, yeah, and then you get four months off. Then you get four months off. Not even because you're the EP, so you right. have to wrap the show out right. and finish all the cuts. So you don't get four months. Yeah. When I was at Bernie, I was like, great, I'm off. No, you're not. Yeah. It was back in the edit bay. But, you get six. That was off. your life. And by the way, you did very nicely. Everyone's yep. tuitions got paid. Yep, yep, yep. Rent was done, mortgage, whatever, all good. What happened after the strike in 08, and again, this is a theory, I can't prove this, is that the studios colluded to take the money out of the writer's hands. And what they did was put in a bunch of rules like if it's your if you're on a first year show, you can't develop. 
Right. Which then morphed into, if you're on any of our shows, you can't develop. Right. Right. And if you develop, it's with us. And if you develop with us, we'll pay you then. We're not giving you extra money for that now. Right. Uh, Mike Murphy my- makes the argument that every time we go on strike, we teach the studios better ways to work without us. We absolutely do. Yeah. And I can tell you, I was president of a division of a studio in 2002 when our beloved union, which I'm still a member of for some right. reason, uh, was about to go out on strike, if you recall. This is 02, and they averted it. But the... CEO of the uh, mega studio that I was working at called all the division heads into a room, many of them you know, yep. and started talking about how we're going to hit the writers where it hurts. We're going to hit them right in their wallet. The minute they go on strike, we force majeure everyone's deals. They're all unemployed immediately. And he started outlining the strategy. And he stopped himself about five minutes in and looked at me and said, are you in the writer's guild? (laughs) And I responded truthfully. I said, yes. And he said, get out. And he kicked me out of the meeting. (laughs) Wow. Most people are working three times as hard for one-fifth the money. Correct. Exactly right. And like your friends in the music business, they have to cobble it together. Yeah, yeah. It's a It's merch. It's touring. It's, you know. Yeah, no, I, it's, uh, it's, but similarly, the barriers to entry have fallen. You don't need to go to Electric Ladyland Studios to lay down your tracks. You can lay it down in your kitchen. Right. Right. And same those thing are- for what you and I do. Final Cut Pro used to be when you and I started doing this, two separate $250,000 Avid systems had to be loaded into an edit right. bay uh, and I've- set up yep. so that you could cut your shows. Now it's called Final Cut Pro. It comes bundled on your Mac. Right. So the the technology has evolved to the point where the barriers to entry fall, but everyone the amount everyone earns has gone down. Yeah, and they always say like, well, your phone now has more technology than Orson Welles had when he made Citizen Kane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the thing they're not making is Orson Welles. <laughs> 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 you know? The only thing missing. Yeah, you still need Orson is Welles. Greg, uh, who was Greg Tolan? Greg Tolan. Yeah, you, you still need Orson Welles and Greg Tolan and John and Joe Mackles. <laughs> Um, and, and the last, the last thing I wanted to talk about, because and you would know, because you're in the business, where it has a negative overall effect on culture is in the news business. Correct. And it was under Reagan that that uh, the major corporations started to turn their news divisions into profit centers. Correct. Well, what they they it's as with all things, Patty Chayefsky was completely prescient, and you see it in the movie Network. They they wouldn't eat the losses anymore. Right. It used to be CBS was the Tiffany standard, the gold standard right. of news, and they had bureaus all over the world. And then all of a sudden, Lawrence Tisch bought CBS, and it became, let's shut the London Bureau. Let's shut the Madrid Bureau. Let's shut that bureau. And they started closing all of them, and that became, they started pooling all the news then. Yeah. But that's the way that you see that it really having a negative influence on our culture is that, you know, my family, my parents watch Fox News, and only Fox News, mm-hmm. and always Fox News. I mean, it's always on. And they can't conceive of how anyone could vote for Hillary Clinton. Like, right. And, and, and that is the effect of that. That's, that's how propaganda works. And no, absolutely. And, and if you only watch, you know, and people say MSNBC is just as bad. Yes. And no, it does the same thing. It's much more elegant. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, there's no impartial source of information gathering. Anymore. None. The closest thing you'll get is the PBS news hour. Yeah, yeah, or BBC World, which yeah, point oh oh two percent of the people listen to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you get like you know you're not going to get an impartial source of news. Yeah, and it's very hard. To Russia know. Today completely impartial. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was Barry Crimmins' old joke. Let's go to the sports page. Hey, everybody won. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of where television is now, do you think it's? I don't think Netflix spending five billion dollars a year. Is sustainable. I no. do not. Well, 77 so, shows. 77 there's, shows. It's just not sustainable. There's no time to watch them. So I, I really don't think that can go on. So are we at peak TV-ish? I think we're almost there. Yeah. Um, I think there's a correction coming. There is a correction coming, yes. And I think that correction, however, will not be bad for us creatively. It will be bad for us financially. Right. Creatively, we will still be able to – it's a golden age. You can we, well. You, can you still, still need you, you still need Orson Welles. That's you right. You still need and the, right. remember. And this is the thing that most executives that I've encountered in twenty some odd years. I've worked at Disney. I've worked at Fox. Now at AMC Networks. Most executives fail to grasp this: the talent pool is finite. Kubrick does not get off the bus in L.A. every day. Right. 
You can't just switch out the pieces. Right. It doesn't work like that. And there's an there's and a, most executives arrogance that thinks you can. They don't believe that. They're like Ang Lee, fuck him. Right. It doesn't matter. Put Brian Singer in there. Right. That's how they think. They really think like that. Well, and it's completely antithetical to making any decent content right. because what you require to make decent content is purity of voice and a vision. Yes. And the, you know, the, in the sense, the first big Simpsons re-up, the executives of Fox famously said, we could replace these guys with high school kids. Well, they tried it. Turns out you can't. Yeah. Turns out but they've can't. never, no one has learned that lesson. They still, to executives, it's widgets. Yeah. You just plug that guy in. It doesn't work like that. No. Creative people who don't understand that the business is a business, it's a bureaucracy, it's amoral, and it's cutthroat, and it's, as they say in The Godfather, it's just business. Yeah. And it's free of justice and logic. Yeah. It's, you enter Thunderdome, <laughs> it's Thunderdome. <laughs> Three shows enter. Right. You can't, but you can't, com- you can't be, com- you can't complain that a guy in a unitard on a bungee cord hit you with a chainsaw <laughs> if you walked into fucking Thunderdome. Correct. Creative people are creative people and they have a vision and they have a voice and they bring you something that you can't just make. Correct. And if, if you could, you would have by now. You can't legislate creativity. If anybody knew what made hits, that's all they would make. That's exactly right. We didn't even get into your car racing. That's a shame. Other podcasts reach for the sky. David Goldbaum. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom, peace out, peace out, you want me?